Good evening, everybody. Tuan Jared was here, but he'll be coming back. I want to welcome everybody to FMA Discussion. This is episode 202. So tonight's episode is more theme oriented in that we won't necessarily be going over individual bios and FMA journey per se, but more we're going to be focused on PTK as a whole now and then and everything in between there. And uh, the guests are tonight are going to be, uh, as you can see here, is Tuan Bill McGrath, Tuan Jared, and Tuan Phil. And hopefully they will be joining us soon and all that. And we're going to get started. If you have not already, please subscribe to FMA Discussion, where we donate all our charitable funds to charity. And you'll be actually helping us help others. And without further ado, we're going to get started. Tuan Jared just joined us. And I want to thank you guys for uh, coming in tonight. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, we've got many people who are excited to hear from all three of you. Hopefully, uh, Tuan Phil will be joining us soon as well. And uh, without further ado, uh, we're going to get started. If you have not seen these guys' previous episodes and you would like to see them and get their bio and journey, for Tuan Bill is episode 98, Tuan Jared, episode 103, and Tuan Phil, episode 131. And I'll put those at the end of the interview if you want to check those out. So again, welcome, guys. Thank you for coming on. Hey, Thanks for the invite. All right. So we're gonna jump right into because we uh, obviously some questions came in. I have questions and all that. So we got a full, uh, full, full load here as far as outline. So um, I want to just let, for, here. What, you know, what made you guys choose PTK? Um, so who who would like to start first on that? Okay, I'll, I'll uh, I, to you. <laughs> yeah, I, I started my journey in the last century. <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. <laughs> Um, honestly, quite honestly, I completely lucked into it. Um, Grandmaster Gahe moved to uh, New York uh, shortly after um, Ferdinand Marcos de declared martial law in the Philippines. His wife at the time, his first wife, was a nurse. And I think he started a few months in Jersey and then moved to New York. He literally moved around the corner from my house in Queens. Wow. And uh, a friend of mine named Mike Maddy. And I were, were uh, you know, two kids looking at martial art magazines, throwing each other around, trying to do stuff. Uh, Mike was able to join first. Um, you know, we heard this guy teaching martial arts uh, in his garage. Um, I couldn't join because it was uh, the very expensive price of $2 a week. And my parents couldn't afford that. So uh, this is when I was 12 and Mike would have been about 10. Uh, so I had to wait till I was 14 and get a paper route. Mm -hmm. Then I could afford it. Uh, inflation had come up by then. Now it's two dollars and fifty cents a week, but I could afford that. And I had not heard of Philippine martial arts. I barely heard of Filipinos, maybe from a movie on TV, uh, but I liked it. Um, for the first six months I was there, we'd be just doing basic kickboxing. Uh, he gave me one form at one point when I was like the only one there uh, with two uh, palm sticks and, and gave me some things. I had no idea what it was at the time. And I never did it again. I, I'm not sure that what that was, but um, you know, it was something with double knife, but it wasn't, he was saying it was just do it with these sticks. I was moving around. Um, but after six months, uh, a regular, a real karate school opened up down the block with uniforms and mats and all the equipment. Everyone left except me and Mike. Uh, and then we stayed and that's how I got started. I just kept going and never stopped. Jared, how about you? Probably more interesting than that. Yeah, well, it was kind of a series of events and I apologize if something's wrong with my, I think I've got a bit of an echo, at least it sounds here, but hopefully you can hear me okay, but- um, No, it's perfect. Actually, it's not bad okay. at all. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was kind of a series of events for me. In, in 94, I, I, when I was 20 years old, I had a, um, I mean, I grew up doing martial arts and um, mostly in New Zealand where I grew up. And, and, at that, and um, when I was 20, I was already here in the States and I, um, I had an opportunity um, to uh, live in the Philippines and it had nothing to do with martial arts, but I was, I was in the Philippines from 94 to 96. And because I was a, a uh, avid martial artist, uh, and I would consider it at that time. I um, I found out about these Filipino martial arts, and I had the opportunity to get um, start start training in some Filipino martial arts in in uh, the Nueva Ecija, Tarlac, and the Aurora provinces in the Philipp in central Luzon, 
and got back from that. And also I was there for two years, came back in 96 and I started, um, you know, I had this kind of passion. I had more time on my hands after I, I completed um, those two years. And so I went back to the Philippines and um, ended up meeting the, um, just by happenstance, because it was close to, they were teaching at a gym in Las Piñas in Manila, close to where I was, um, I was staying at that during that trip. And I met um, Grand, uh, Grandmaster Nene Tortal. Well, actually it was his, his son, Gerson Jr. And then through him met his father and, and started training in the in their family system. And it really, it was, it was different than what I had experienced in other Filipino martial arts that I had been exposed to. And um, and so I, I was back and forth. I was, I was living, I moved to Hawaii at the time. And, and um, but that it really intrigued me. And as I delved deeper into that, I found about, out about Pekiti Tersha and Grand Tuhon and, and his notoriety and had a chance to start training with him. And um, so it's kind of, I went through a couple of evolutions or, or a couple of changes. But when I found Piketty Tersha, um, compared to the other Filipino martial arts I had trained, been training in, it just had, it was, it was more complete for me. It answered a lot of questions that I had. It was more of a complete system. You know, it addressed, you know, the weapons, the empty hands, the counter weapons, and, and many different subsystems of weapons. And, and so it, um, and the way I like to always express it, there was a lot of breadth in the art and, the, and, and there was a lot of depth in the art. I could keep training in um, several different things in, um, in each, each subsystem of the art. And so it just, that attracted me about Piketty Tersha Kali and I kind of stuck with it ever since. I, my passion for the martial arts um, with, continued and I, and I continued my study of other martial arts, but for me, Piketty Tersha became my core, my core, like the core of my study. As far as FMA, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So we got some folks saying hi here. Let me just acknowledge them. Hopefully, two on Phil will be joining us. Um, Phil says he's watching us. At I know. I just sent another message though to try to get on and not, not watch us. But we got GMA, we got Royce, Justin, James Lynn, Eric O'Brien, and Jeremy, two on Phil, two on Jack. We got Paulo. Hey, we got uh, GM Dan Medina. All right, all right, all right. Okay. So what um, you know, so. As far as you getting in there and all that, uh, you know, what really resonated with you guys? You might have already touched on this in your opening, particularly Jared, John Jared, but what really resonated with each of you to stay this long in just one system? That being, of course, PTK. Want to go first? You want me to go first? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think a lot of it is personality. Uh, Peter Tertia is a very big system, it's a very intricate system. A lot of boys go through a stage where you're taking your toys apart to see how they work. Mm -hmm. I never outgrew that. I, I really like to dissect it. Anything I see, I really want to understand. Okay, does it work? Check mark. That's not enough for me. I want to know why it works and why it works better than this other way, if it does work better than the other way. So um, that just got really, really interesting to me. And once I got into it, I had to finish it. Um, you know, that's why I moved down to Texas to to stay with Leo. Um, and if I slip, guys, no disrespect to Grand Tuonis, how I grew up with him, calling him Leo. His daughters still call me Uncle Billy. You know, it's just we were family back then. So um, I moved down there to continue my studies. I just, once you get into a certain amount of it, and you, you really want to learn the whole thing. And then once I got the whole thing, it was really a lot of fun to teach it. You know, I have a, a teacher's personality. Um, and there's two things that give teachers a lot of joy. One is learning something new. And two is teaching somebody something that's new for them. And explaining all well, the details of it and why it works and Yappa yappa yeah, and we like to talk a lot. So, Jared, your turn. Yeah, I mean, for me, um, it, the kind of well, there was a couple of factors for me. One is uh, ever since my youth, um, I, I just something attracted me about weapons. Okay, I, even though I loved martial arts and the martial arts I studied were um, empty hand focused primarily uh, as a, as a, in my youth. Um, something about weapons always just attracted me. I even, you know, when I was a kid in New Zealand, I was a teenager, I, I collected knives, you know? And so there's something about weapons that always, I still have some of those knives from my teenage connect, collect, uh, collection actually. But um, so I, there was something about 
Americans always attracted me. And then, so the, the Filipino martial arts in general attracted me for that reason. Um, but as I got into, you know, in, in the in the nineties when I was lived, when I was attending university in in, um, uh, in Hawaii, I was working as a um, a bouncer at, a, at a, essentially a doorman at a, a nightclub in Honolulu. And then as and then as I got, when in the year two thousand, I got into police work uh, here in, in Utah. I moved back to Utah. I got into police work and. And for me, um, even though I was studying other Filipino, other martial arts, I should say, that were empty hand focused, um, for me, Kitty Tertia, uh, I saw that it was going to be beneficial to me in the in the in the multi, multi, multi in the in the dimensions that it addressed. It addressed, you know, the the use of weapons, which a police officer needs to know. It addressed how to counter weapons, which a police officer needs to know. It addressed empty hand control tactics and so on and so forth. So pretty much everything that I that I I, I saw it. I never thought at that point that I would be teaching it for as part of my living. I was just training it because I saw it as a way to to help me as I got into that law enforcement career. And so that was one of the you know one of the one of the main reasons for it also. Wow. So you came out as a byproduct. Okay. All right. Wow. Interesting. Um, you know, just you know, far as uh, you know, guy. I mean, you know, obviously, we keep on a very, very positive aspect here um, and all that. But he seems to. Again, you guys are certainly going to know this better than me. Um, I've gone to a couple seminars with. I definitely saw a charismatic guy. I, you know, some of the things that came out, I could see how you would be attracted to somebody like that. I mean, from the few seminars I've been to, um, I don't want to say intoxicating, but definitely. Could gen certainly generate a curiosity um, and all that, but so you know what um you know what clicked with you guys? I mean, as far as his personality, I mean, did he draw you in, so to speak, or you know? You know, I, I started at fourteen. Leo was in his early thirties when I met him. Um, he was just a regular family guy. He wasn't doing a big seminars. He was just teaching outside of his. You know, in his garage, and then we spent about a year moving to basements of little uh, Philippine businesses, bakeries, and restaurants and whatnot. We would te he would teach in there, and he really didn't get into a, a, a official school until we went to the uh, political court on the uh, roof of the Philippine consulate, uh, Manhattan. I want to say September or August of '76. Um. So you really didn't see the, the charisma when you're just working out with him. It's Billy hit this a thousand times, you know. Um, but he, he he was a different person when he's putting on a show than when he's at home. You know, at home he's a family guy. You're eating with the family, watching TV together. You know, um, I, I held back on saying this in public for many years when my son was in school. But a lot of times, if I went to school and the public school I went to, if you, you were allowed more times late than you were absent. Mm -hmm. So if I found myself late to high school, I just turn around and, and go to Leo's house and he'd open a door in there where I was sitting on his doorstep. Hey, Leo, can we train? You know, so uh, a different relationship. But I remember, you know, we used to have long conversations about different things. I remember he came over to my house, my parents' house one day. Uh, Billy, can you come with me? My friend died. I, I, I can't have nobody to go with me. So we went together, went to his friend's funeral. Uh, and then afterwards, we're sitting in the car talking about religious issues and things. And, and you know, he had a really, really rough childhood. And there's a lot of things that w went on because of that. So um, it's, it's a very different relationship to me. I kind of saw both sides of him, the on stage and the backstage. Um, but you know, Leo, Leo was always a really good talker. Um, you know, so it's, it's part of his personality, part of the upbringing, part of a reaction to his upbringing, uh, that he can't overcome the hardships through effective communication, let's say. Jared, well, how would, what would you add to that? Yeah, I mean... Without a doubt, for me, um, that was part of the my attraction to the to the not to the just to the system, but to the to the individual that that was overseeing that was teaching the system because um, it's a package. I mean, for me, I'll, I'll, you know, people, I think the art is is really only as is going to be as good as the the, the, uh, the ability the instructor has to relay it, communicate the uh, mm -hmm. transfer knowledge. 
Um, and so, you know, that, and for me, that was a big thing is this, his ability, his charisma, you know, everyone knows he's just, which I think is, is a blessing and a curse for, for him because, you know, the, the <laughs> charisma sometimes has been, um, as, as, as not being, um, I guess it's, it's gotten the best of him at certain times, you know, and I won't kind of elaborate on that, but, uh, he's very charismatic, very likable, very likable. He's got a infectious laugh he's very disarming with how he you know and, and, and not and, and i no, no pun intended but uh, uh but he's uh and, and, and the way that he conducts himself and um and so that that's a big part of it is, is his that and his ability to take that charisma and use it as a way to 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 to, to teach to instruct and, and and help people to open up and and learn i think is um is always you know kind of uh, been part of the attraction for me also yeah one of the summer was that when I first met him, um, it's the, it was kind of a political aspect. It was out to say sack at the time. He said, don't wear your shirts there. You know what I mean? I'm like, you know, my first experience with politicalness. And I'm like, okay, this is this is bizarre. But okay, I, I won't wear either shirt. And I remember him coming up to me. He goes, goes, your ancestors were European and they fought in wars and all that. And, you know, I'm like, you know, just was taken back. And just the fact that he's even talking to me and, you know, but... I only bring this up to kind of further your point to on Jared is that, you know, I was like, yeah, man, he just came up to me and talked to me <laughs> almost hook, line and sinker. And, you know, so I definitely, I mean, he's got a, he's got a gift of gab. I mean, you know, he's I, got you, skills. You know? We moved to Texas in 82 and when uh, he, he and the family went down there in February, I went down there in June. When I got down there, uh, he had a house already. And he had a car, and the car he got was his big Ford station wagon, you know, the really big limousine-sized ones back in those days were huge. And he said he went to the car dealership, you know, you know, new in town, and talked the owner of the car dealership to co-signing the loan for him to get the car. <laughs> Have you ever heard of that in your life? No, you have a gift. Yeah, he does. He does. He yeah. told me he read Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And his takeaway from that was, and this is a book on, on charitable works, basically, but his, mm -hmm. his takeaway on that is, the line he remembers is, if you wish to have influence over someone, give them a feeling of importance and a desire to be great. And that's his opening line with a lot of people. You know, I mean, there's no feeling of importance and a desire to be great. And that's kind of a double-edged sword because, you know, you can use that wrong or you can use it right. But um, yeah, I felt but, it. Yeah, it does. It does <laughs> just the door. I'm sold. You know, I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming. Man. <laughs> and then I kind of some folks spoke to me and I'll leave it at that. Um, so. We got uh, Tuan, Phil, if you're still watching, please keep trying. Um, uh, try copy and pasting the link, try the new link. Um, we got on yesterday, so hopefully you'll get on. Um, keep my fingers crossed. Um, so with, um, with that, then what did, you know, far as, like, what did he, what stood out? I mean, obviously, there's, I mean, I, there's a bunch of stuff. Um, Oh, thank you so much, Tuan Jack. Um, like, what did what did he instill in you? Like, what really stood out? Like, far as your journey with him, is there one or two things that he instilled that really resonated and still stick with you today? Doesn't, I'm not talking about so much physical techniques. Per Hold se. on, we're getting some little kids in the background yelling. That's probably me. Here, let me give give me one second here. I, I, it's, uh, sorry, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Paulo. The Paulo and Tuan Jack are both working with Tuan Phil. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, they're helping him. Good. Good. Very yeah, good. Absolutely. He got on yesterday, so it can't be. Yeah. What was your question again? I'm sorry. What was your question again, Dean? Oh, I'm sorry. So, outside of physical techniques or tactic, I mean, like, what is like, what are the things that you remembered in your in your tenure with him? And this this question is for both of you that you know that re he really instilled in you i mean maybe a life lesson maybe but just something that really instilled uh, in you that you remember his his overarching teaching philosophy 
uh, back then is we would not give you stuff on a silver platter. I remember we uh, when we did the 64 attack drills, and I phrase it like that because at first they weren't called 64 attacks. We did uh, the first set of the object scenario, then we did full wall and umbrella and, and made many drills of those. And then we did all the, the other drills in 64 attacks, break and break out, Sagang Labo, uh, tapping on 589, uh, and then uh, the seven attacks and the fourth, they kind of stand alone pieces. But anyway, um, we did three years of those drills. We spent six months, literally six months, on just break in, break out. And all the permutation of grips, right hand, left hand, full grip, reverse grip, double break in, this and that, right? Um, and then um, right about when Tom came back from winning the 79 tournament, so this would have been, I think, uh, spring, spring of 79, late spring of 79, we started working on the first set of Sagitas. And he gave it to us. Uh, the The training we had at the time was Tuesday and Thursday night, two hours, and then Saturday was four to six hours, a longer class. And on a, a six-hour class, I'm guessing it was a long, a complicated set. He gave us the whole first set, set of Sagitas, and then he would not review us with us with, for six months. Oh, you guys work it out. You guys work it out. You guys work it out. Mm. You know, I would remember something, and Tom would remember something, and Another guy remembers something, um, and we try to work out not only not simply what the sequence was, but why this technique was done this way. Because you had to reverse engineer it. If you, he's just showing you the form in the air, he's not telling you why you're doing things this way and what the hits are. Mm. Uh, and you know, keep asking, 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 suffer, suffer, suffer. Finally, six months said, "Okay, now, guys." Here's Sagita, he's the details, and he went over the details with us. Um, he has a principle called the thought provoking process. And it's kind of like uh, teaching under the uh, uh, Socrat Socratic, Socratic, Socrates method, where you ask a question of the student to get them to think about what the answer should be. And if you, when you go to my blog post, my blog section on my website, you'll see us one that says, uh, go ask grandma, Leo stories in there. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of his teaching method. And for the guys who haven't seen that real quick, go ask grandma was Leo, young Leo would go to grandfather and ask a question and he wouldn't get the information on a silver platter. Grandpa, what is this? Oh, gee, I forget the name of that. What does it do? Oh, you can cut rope with that. Oh, very good. I almost have it. Uh, Go, go ask uh, grandma what that is. Grandma, what is that? What is this called? What's the name of this? Oh, uh, what does it do? Uh, you can cut rope with it. Oh, uh, I almost have it. What else does it do? Uh, you can butter bread with it. Oh, very good. I almost have it. I almost have it, but not quite. Go ask first uncle. And Leo would make the round, right? And then when he gets to a certain point, uh, based on his age, have mercy on that. That's called a knife. Now I want you to go back and tell everyone who helped you get the name what it does, what the name is, and what it does. Mm. So what we're doing is the kid is getting analysis skills. He's getting a desire for the information. By the time you figure out what the name is, you don't forget that name, right? And you're getting repetition because every time you go to the new relative, you have to say what it is and what it does. Uh, and he would do that to us a lot. He would give you a lot of times, especially anything that had a form involved with it, Mm. We do the form and then said, work out the applications. And then later on, he would go and correct you on things. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, um, Jared, what was your experience like with him? What, what teaching methodologies you would stick in your mind with him? Uh, Jared, you're, de you're deaf. You're mute. Okay. I was quieting my kids there. Sorry. I just, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I was, uh, um, so there's a lot of, number of uh, life lessons, I guess you could say that that that's, that have stuck with me. But probably one of the one of the, the most important ones, I guess, would be the importance of um, hard work and, um, and and mental fortitude when it comes to really learning um, learning. I mean, there's a lot of life lessons that can come from that, but specifically with regards to um, the to training Piketty Tertia, um, the importance of um, uh, 
meaningful repetition uh, in, in the art. Um, and I, and I, you know, one example, this is, this is back in my early years of training with him. And, uh, you know, back then when he started coming back to the States, he didn't have a residence here in the, in the, um, in the States. So he would come with, come to your place and sometimes stay several weeks because until he had his next seminar and then whoever was hosting that would fly in there. So he would stay with me for extended periods of time. And, and, um, and I would invite some of my students over. Some of them would, you know, just to kind of help him make a little bit of extra money while he was there. They would, you know, they'd pay for private lessons. And I remember in those early days that people would come, you know, people, some students would come and, okay, okay, we're ready for, for our training session. And I had this big tree in my backyard and he'd, you know, just start, okay, go get your sticks and start hitting the trees. Give us some good solid ones, some twos, and then some one, two combinations. And then he would go, and, and this is a paid private session. And we would hit the, hit the, hit the tree and he'd go in and and get some get some breakfast, some coffee, and just kind of take his time and come out an hour or so later to make sure st we were still hitting the tree in this paid private session. And um, and I, for me, I was kind of a little bit it was a little bit embarrassing because I was um, I had students that were, were were paying for this private lesson and we were just hitting the tree. Um, and as the years went by, I um, I um, you know started to understand a little bit of and and, and I even asked him, you know, and he, he expressed this to me. And there's several things to be learned from that. One is just, you know, um, if you don't have a good and solid one and two, then don't worry about all the fancy stuff because it's not going to help you in a fight. And so this, the, 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 this uh, understanding the importance of, of a good, solid set of fundamentals, you know, and that's fundamentals win fights. And that's one of the things that I, you know, really uh, learned from those, um, from the, those times. And um, but part of it is the mental fortitude behind that, because even with the guys, the footwork, right? He'd have you do footwork. We'd, we'd do, go to the Philippines and do training camps with him. And we'd just be doing these footwork drills up and down the beach and, you know, doing stuff on our knees with broken shell, you know, beat, not, not smooth sand, like broken shells and stuff. So you'd be cutting your knees and doing all this stuff and, and just doing it for hours in the hot blazing sun. And, um, and then, you know, he, and at some point I remember him, you know, uh, just kind of, um, expressing to me that part of what he's doing is is testing people's mind you know if they're gonna if they're, if they're the kind of student that he really wants to teach they'll stick through all of that and then he'll start giving them some some real um some real substance in the art but um so part of it was just the hammering in fundamentals and part of it was um you know the type of peace person that and, and he would he, he kind of would often say and i think he had some i don't know some shirts or something at one point that said something about the few the a few, the, uh, the crazy, the, the Tersians or something like that, you know, he kind of stole the Marine Corps thing. But it was, uh, but the, the idea being, you know, he's got these, these crazy few students that will stick through all of that. And those are the students that he knew had dedication that he wanted to teach. So it wasn't, you know, in today's day and age, I don't think it's a great um, marketing, uh, <laughs> marketing yeah, method to, to weed out people. You want, you know, you want to get as many people as you can if you're trying to make a living doing it. But it was very old school way of thought, you know, of, of just, you know, not not just having you know not just the quantity but the quality of student that he was looking for. Um, so there's you know, some some of the things about you know um, the, the importance of fundamentals and also um, mental fort and the importance of mental fortitude when it comes to trick because it's not always you know it's not always fun. Sometimes it's hard work and you got to understand if you want to get good at it you got to go through the hard work. Yeah, I remember the process. Yeah. yeah, I remember yeah. sitting standing in his basement when he moved to a big apartment building in the boiler room with this green, large, dark green standpipe with this red metal cast iron wheel on it. And I had to go and do a jab without hitting the metal wheel, but almost hitting the metal wheel. Do that a thousand times. And the stick on the bottom of the stick had uh, sandpaper tape on it, like tread tape you put on a skateboard or a short staircase tread. But mine I've learned to put down just on parallel through middle finger. His was the whole bottom. So I'm there trying to do a thousand jabs at like 14 years old. Then he moved there maybe six, eight months after uh, I started training with him. And, you know, I got up to, I don't know what, a hundred. And I'm looking at my hands like chopped meat from doing the jabs of the sandpaper tape. Do you remember that big noise you heard? Uh, probably, I don't know, the summertime of uh, 1975. That was me going, wah! He got this liniment of alcohol. I was uh, doing that too, but it's because I was two years old. But Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he put that on my hand. It burned. I mean, he never got an infection with that stuff. 
but it was heavy duty. But he would do that a lot to people of, you know, you sit here, do a lot of times. And I was a kid, do this a thousand times. I don't think I ever made it to a thousand. It took pity on me after a while as a kid. But the, the thinking was twofold. One is the mental aspect. If you can get through a, a thousand times of this simple thing, if you send, set the mountain so high a thousand times, uh, you know, you get to a hundred, it feels like no big deal. If you tell them do this a hundred times, you're like, oh, gee, a hundred is tough. The other thing is uh, when you're dealing with a, a, a child or possibly even an adult with no background, it's very hard to give them the theory of what you're doing. If I'm throwing a cross, I want you to twist your hips this much. I want you to rotate your shoulders this much. I want the elbow behind the fist. I want you to, you know, to give them the, the internal dynamics of things, of the theory of why something works is impossible with a kid. It's even hard with a lot of adults. But if you tell someone to do it a thousand times, they will eventually get so tired that they will find the most efficient way to do something. Mm. They can get through those high numbers. I, I remember I was doing, uh, we had a series in the 80s where we just had a lot of seminars at uh, hardcore, hard karate schools. And I would just have to, I can't go in there in a, in a two hour class and try to give them one technique working in the dirt like that. So I'd, I'd give them a high reps of push ups, set up squats and cycles till they were tired. And then they would relax and they'd be more flexible. They move quickly. They could be, they were too tired to be inefficient. And that's part of what that is going on too. It's, it's both mental and physical. Okay. Jared, anything to add on that? Uh, we can't hear you again. I keep doing that. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, exactly. I, um, I, 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 I recall uh, oftentimes at these, these you know, conferences we do in the Philippines where um, it's, it's kind of a sad thing, but a lot of the higher level instructors at these camps will kind of stay out of eye shot of Grant Tuhon because he has a way of um, physically torturing them. Um, and and, um, <laughs> and when, when it comes to, you know, running whatever it is he's teaching, and I can recall times where he would, rather than focusing on the student, he would get the instructor, and I've been the, 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 the object of this at times, where I would come into the middle of the circle of students, and it's a particular takedown, disarm to takedown or something like that. And every student in that circle needs to do 100 repetitions, or you will do 100 repetitions on them, and it'll go through the entire circle of and to the point like just like you said by the by the time you've got through the third person your blisters are already are already broken you've, you've developed and broken and by the time you've finished the whole thing you know, you've kind of almost callous them you're not feeling anything anymore it's all just numbness right and and that that um a lot of times his that that would be um his i guess you could say i don't know what to say i guess testing testing of his instructors to see um, you know, to see if they're going to uh, go through that, you know, like you said, it's a physical and a mental thing, but, um, and, and because a lot of the instructors know he's going to test them, that a lot of instructors that are familiar with his ways would oftentimes kind of like hide behind a, tree, a coconut tree or something like that while he's teaching them. <laughs> okay. It's going to be <laughs> him, not me. But, shoe, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or just kind of staying brain. away altogether. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it's, again, it's just one of those things that, that he'll do, um, and, uh, to, to kind of, whether it's testing an instructor to see if he wants them to continue being, uh, you know, through his ranks, or or whether it's just kind of going a, a repetition for the uh, for those the students that are doing a particular technique, also. In the seventies, when we were doing those uh, six months of just the break and breakout drill, the first twenty minutes was simply doing the three count box part in the beginning, you know, forehand, low backhand, high backhand, for twenty minutes, you know. Uh, it got to the point where the cal we would, well the lactic acid would build up so much, you literally had to pull the stick out of your hand and peel your fingers open because you could not open up your hand. It got to the point I remember many many times, the calluses were so thick in your hand that if they got too thick they would actually rip. So you have to trim the calluses with a razor blade to keep them down to the right level, or else they get so much leverage over the surrounding skin that's not calloused. It actually rip off the whole callus. It wasn't a blister. It was a callus ripping away because it got too thick. Mm. So, you know, he he was hardcore. But he was, you know, back in those days, he was doing it himself. He's, he's working with everybody. He's not standing on the side pointing. He's, you're, he's doing it right along with you. And that really impressed me a lot because to me, you know, back then, I, you know, I'm a teenager, a guy in his 40s is old, you know. 
and he's doing the slow push-ups on his knuckles and everything else we're doing, doing the whips and the, the uh, warm-up a lot of times. If we weren't doing that section, that warm-up, uh, especially camps was Dirty Dozen, he was doing it right along with us, you know, 100 reps on each number. Um, so, you know, leading from the front, uh, it was hard, and he's older than you, he's, you know, a lot older than you, it's really hard to say no. Mm. Um, it's it's tougher, you know, as he gets older to, to kind of keep up that thing. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the heart is still there, you can tell. Uh, well, I'm just going to kind of speak out loud too. Uh, Apollo and Tuan Jack, um, uh, Tuan Phil, if you're getting the message to join live stream, that's the button you want to push. That's basically what's going to bring you up on here. Uh, that's 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 correct. So hopefully, um, I'll get John here, but definitely hit the live stream um, and all that, and then choose Facebook. But that's it sounds like you're in the right place. So I'm hoping. But uh, so when all right, so through this, basically your experiences, what you guys just kind of outlined, what you guys just you know spoke on as far as uh, Tuangahe, you now guys are all teaching. So what um what do you personally from the experience with him, your own creativity, your own journey, expression, what have you? What do each of you stress in your curriculum as far as students go? Depends who I'm teaching, what type of group. Um, and, and I can I can go on hours on that. We better pass it to Jared because I've, I've talked a lot so far already. Yeah, right, Jared. Just, you know, generic. Yeah, that's all. Uh, yeah, I mean, for, for me... I, I kind of I understand what what uh, Tu and Bill is talking uh, is you know talking about when it comes to who are you teaching because um, you know if I, I, I a lot of my seminars I, I kind of generically divide into two groups it's either they're either actual Pakiti Tosha practitioners or martial artists you know that are, want to join one of our seminars of they come from different backgrounds or it's a police military focused type of an event and that is um, uh, a different methodology, different focus, obviously. But uh, for me, um, it's I, I I'm I'm bigger because of because a lot of people come to me looking for um, tactical application. You know, people that come to my seminars, they like you know they want to. That's what I'm kind of known for, I guess you could say. And so I, I spend a lot of time focusing on um, on on fundamental skill sets from from. Um, you know from beginning to end and what i mean by that is you know um, initial initial responses to, to to attacks through to um through to finishing type techniques you know the whole trying to get through a whole a whole spectrum there and um and 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 kind of giving people you know the way that i like to teach is giving people um kind of putting things into perspective not just drilling drills you know because a lot of the people that i that i train they uh, drills uh, um don't really help them if they don't understand the application because they're there to learn how to apply these things so uh, focusing a lot on on, um, on the application of, of whatever whatever it is we're training at that time. So I end up teaching a lot of, for example, counter knife stuff um, in certain environments. I'll teach a lot of um, you know uh, stuff that applies to expandable batons, for example. How do I apply the stick to these stick techniques, the expandable baton type techniques, and things that uh, oftentimes have a high relevance in either um, a law enforcement environment or a personal self defense type of a situation? Is I find a lot of my focus being. Okay. I said yeah. something to uh, us, to you guys last night, and uh, I think that really. Um, now I'm thinking about it. I think it really kind of explains a lot about differences in teaching style and teaching at different event times. I said um, Leo's like an emergency room doctor, and if you go to him, he's good at solving your particular problem. Uh, but I think it's a little more than that. When and I, I said, he, if you go to him and ask to be a, a to teach you how to be a doctor, it's a different course entirely. And I think a lot of it is a difference in teaching styles. Is I went to I was training with Leo when he was running a medical medical school, and he was teaching us a lot, very very much as close as he could, in the way he was trained as a kid. Uh, we were talking a bit about the um, um, Trivi formula. And um, 
Oh, now I think from the 90s on, what Leo's really started to do is, um, is do that emergency room doctor thing where you come to him with a specific problem and he's going to solve that specific problem. So uh, obviously, let's say uh, police and uh, military uh, both need techniques and, and material tailored to them. But at least in the United States, law enforcement has a very different mission statement running than the military would. Um, so you both have a compressed time. You have to give these guys stuff that will work for them. Uh, assuming they have no martial art background, you have to assume kind of everyone, the training is at the speed of the lowest, slowest guy, right? Slowest walker. So uh, you, you have to tailor make the technique for them that they can learn and they're willing to practice with the equipment they have, with the environment they are in, yes, which is wow. very, very different if you want to be a, 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 go to him and say, teach me the way you were taught. I want to, I want to be a teacher the way you want. I want to learn the whole system. So I think that, that really, hey, hey Phil. Hello, Phil. Thank freaking God for this. So, what, so uh, did you, what did you find a young person to help you? Um, no, I got. I used my iPhone, and it never did this before, and it did it. It worked. So well, okay. we have to thank. Uh, I don't. I, I've and, learned uh, to believe that Jack. no matter what happens, if it works eventually, it works. Okay. There we go. Well, we're glad you made it. Better and, late than never. Yeah, for the last bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. We're. I think we should go on longer because Phil came on late. I don't even know if we're halfway <laughs> through. So, um, really. Don't worry about it. We just so we haven't really even gotten to the hard stuff. So, no, I'm I'm, I'm glad you made it. Uh, and thanks thanks for the guys who helped. Thank you. Um, if I can ask a question, um, Phil. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, Phil, you had had you heard most of what we were saying? Uh, well, a lot of it I couldn't because I had a choice to listen to you or to actually try to fix a problem. Oh, okay. as soon as that problem I was going to ask if there's anything you wanted to add to what we said, but. Yeah. Uh, there Good probably point. is. I just don't know what it is. <laughs> I can go quick here. Let me just, I'll, I'll just Phil. Uh oh, Phil, where, where are you? We don't see you anymore. I don't know. I, just a second. It's, your, it's your, uh, something with when your fingers are <laughs> the camera. It won't, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, don't camera. put the finger on the little circle on top there, Phil. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Tuan Phil, I'm just going to give you a quick recap. Okay. So, what we covered thus far was, you know, you know why you guys chose PTK. Why you why thus uh, for so long you stuck with it you know as far as your system you know what resonated to keep you that long, um, and then we got on to you know what Tuan guy was you know what did he really instill in you, and then uh, what kind of teacher we covered that and now really what we're on right now is what do each one of you stress individually, far as curriculum far as your students go. Tuan Jared, obviously teaching law format a little different, depending on who's in the room, as opposed to maybe Tuan Bill, who's got PTK guys in there. So if you want to kick on, if you want to join in on that one. Okay. Um, I, I, have you guys finished your stuff or am I? Yeah, go, go, go. Oh, okay. so, you got to catch up, Phil. Yeah, all right. <laughs> anyway, um, I believe that... Uh, you know, the, the Dosi Methodos is actually the, the foundation of what we do. I mean, we're, we do an awful lot of other stuff on top of it, but the Dosi Methodos is still the combination of, of what we, uh, you know, what we, what we do. And even if you, uh, one of the things I've actually noticed, um, one of the things um, I've talked about this before, but there's um, actually a, I, there was a system I'd always heard about, but never practiced before. And it's Wego Toto, Wego Torada. And uh, I'd heard about it from different people. I mean, the notes that I got from Tom Pizio from when I was starting with him, the stuff I continued doing with you, Tom Bill. The, well, there's an awful lot of stuff that was in there. And there's this this one, Wego Toto, Wego Torada. It was like three lines. And I wrote all three of them because it was just like bits and pieces I have. You know, it was like if you're panning for gold, and you get a nugget here, so you write it down. You get a nugget. So we had, I found three nuggets, you know, that that actually had nothing to do with the system. And uh, you know, I started realizing that that's the situation. And you know, I mean, uh, Tom Bill was talking about when uh, GT moved to uh, to Texas, 
Well, one of the other things that he did that, uh, you know, one of the things he got to, uh, to on Erwin Bayarta to move to Texas to tour, he was moving at the same time. And while they shared an apartment together before uh, Tuangahe's family moved down to uh, Texas to be with him, he would he actually taught Irwin this system. And it was it's kind of funny because a, a system. I said, oh, okay, well, you know, what is what is this? And you realize that most of the stuff has always been covered. I mean, ninety nine percent of the stuff you you would use in the future will probably be covered in the first few lessons. But it'll take you years to discover that information. And, you know, it's a, it's one of those, you know, very funny situations. But when it comes down to, to a guy, he would, he would have you do it, you know, cause he would, he, you know, I would, the bits and pieces I got, I got, you know, you'd hear, you know, like the, what, what Tuan uh, guy he was like at the beginning. Cause I remember, I remember I, I started in 1981, which, you know, which is way, way after most of uh, you know, Tuan Bill, I think he was by well, early seventies, most of the other guys early, you know, 75, you're not too far past me. Yeah, well, I mean, far far enough so that in that time of quick learning, it was like you were expecting me. Like, I remember that one videotape that I sent you. You know, they, you guys were doing the spotted diga for set of seguidas and disarms, and mm -hmm. you know, quite honestly, you know, like, and the irony, of course, is that you know when you see the stuff now, you realize that they they aren't the same thing anymore. <laughs> you go, oh, okay. So you have that that feeling of. Okay, I'm being led. I'm being hung out to dry, or I'm being given an opportunity to actually learn the stuff that means something to me. And you start realizing after a while that uh, you know that's that's the situation. You you really have to become your 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 own best teacher. I mean, uh, I'm sure you know when uh, you know when when Tuan Jared started doing this stuff and he started picking the information, he would have he would put it together, but you know he would have to have to decide how can I show this to other people who are in law enforcement who are not going to be the guy who's going to come on Tuesday and Thursday nights and practice for an hour or an hour and a half. He's got a guy who, who, you know, basically is really, really good at what he does, but he wants to be better at a certain very, very limited field of information. So for example, if a guy happens to have, a, you know, he happens to have a gun, but you, you know, you, all you have to do is read the newspapers and realize that you can't just shoot everybody because if you do, they get upset at you for some reason, right? So do you have to be able to do something? If You know, I mean, you hear idiotic stuff like, well, he came at me with a gun, so you should have shot him in the legs. Uh, what? He had a yeah. gun. Yeah, yeah, but he was, you should have shot him in the legs. Have you ever been shot? Have you ever shot anybody in the legs? Well, of course not. I'm, I'm a law-abiding citizen. Said, yeah, but really, if you think that you're going to stop somebody from, you know, who is charging at you like a mad bull, from who's actually trying to commit suicide by cop, I think that's the word described. They 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 don't sit there and, and go, okay, so I'm going to go until I get shot in the leg because they're going to shoot me in the leg. No, they they're going to come in and they're going to try and kill you, and you have to do something to stop them. Now, if they happen to have a knife and you have a gun, there's a you know there's a force escalation. You can't actually you can't just shoot the guy because well. If you do that, you may you may survive, but you may not necessarily keep your job. And a lot of these guys, you know, they like to put in their thirty years and get their retirement. I mean, like I, I you know, I I can totally relate to that. So mm. it's a matter of having to be to adjust every time because you know I I teach a combination of things. I teach um, you know I try to teach the dos and methodos, but there's a lot of stuff that you know when you you start realizing that you can't just teach it that way. You can't just teach it. The way you got it because it was given to you not on a silver platter but you, you kind of had to pick and choose and and see these things i, I mean i remember once when uh, i think it's mid mid 80s gt was starting to teach that the spotted dagger stuff he's starting to teach the the control you know the the four parts of it like the, you had the seguitas and he was teaching that part and then after that you got the contratas and after that you the recontras and then disarms and there was like a four part section that, you know, and then you had to, then in those days, he was also teaching the stuff he called that I refer to now as pre contratas because there are, they're just techniques that kind of exist within the system. But if you don't have them, it kind of puts it difficult to, to you know, it's difficult to actually learn how to do this stuff. And so you start doing it and you start going over and start getting better at it because it's, you know, the, all the, the skids, you know, like you could, you could, if you wanted to, 
learn all that stuff right from scratch, but you would have a difficult time because this was, I mean, I don't know how many brothers Tuang uh, Gra, or Tuang, uh, Grand Tuhan Conrado Tortal had. Conrado, I think, I don't know, I think if there was five of them or Conrado had five brothers. Okay, so he had, so there, he had five brothers. So there were six people in the family that were there as training partners all the time. With different personalities and yeah. who went to different islands to train and come back and bring stuff. And exactly, you know, so and, and you hear stories about that, and and you just realize how difficult that is because just this idea. I mean, like I've heard, you know, um, I've I've heard stories from uh, or of um, what was it called Antonio Listrisimo's training, and you know, the same kind. He kind of had to do the same sort of thing, like. Go, you know, exactly. he was at 14 or 15, he was, mm -hmm. he moved to the Mindanao and, and was adopted by a Muslim family yeah, and did so, all these things. And, mm -hmm. you know, just there, there was all sorts of trips and you, you just can't just say, well, I'll just go and do that. Well, God help you. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, how, are you, how on earth can you just, you know, say, I'm going to do that? Because there's a, you know, an, a, a series of happy coincidences that exist for the, people to actually learn how to do this stuff properly. I mean, 90% of it, I, I would say that, you know, the, in, you know, when we practice this material, it's not as if we get there and say, okay, I now know how to do Espadadago or I now know how to do this stuff. There's, uh, you know, I, for example, one of the things that I have done is I have dissected my interpretation of the first set of Sagitas and I apply the first five movements to that first movement of the, um, uh, of the break in, break out, or not break in, break out, but the 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 pangasing drill, the uh, skong lebo drill, the one that we practice, the very first thing where you do a thrust, a, a number two disarm, a number two umbrella, and a number one umbrella as as your first your, mm -hmm. your first and so you go back and forth. So you're either repeating a high number one or a high number five, and so you have all of these things that you're doing. And then I said, well, okay, so as you're doing it, yeah, as you do that first umbrella, that's kind of like the first thing that you practice in the Sagitas. So instead of doing the horizontal, I just said, fine. So I mean, because it's like, you just realize that everything is context, right? It, it can't be anything but context. So if you're doing it, if somebody's attacking you and you happen to do that movement, well, there's this, tra this kind of trail you can go down. And if you don't go down that trail, that's fine. But there's five variables. And then uh, the six, seven, and eight, well, I, there's, I do that. That's kind of from the second movement, because when you kind of come up with do the, the to do the second movement, oh, that's all the stuff that exists in the second and third, the seven, eight, and nine, and the nine and ten is perfectly perfectly suited for the third movement, because because you're coming down, you're you're clearing the movement, and you're able to do the clearing, and you say, oh, okay, so now you're, and then the eleven, twelve are kind of like variable, you know, like okay, things that you can finish off the guy with, and it, it's like, oh, okay, so. I, I kind of, I try to make these things for me personal so that, I mean, uh, you know, I'm 68 years old. I got to work at remembering stuff. You know, it's like, it's not, it's nothing personal, but it's like, you know, I have to, you know, like if I read a book, you know, I, I have a heart, you know, I, I'm bad with names. I'm really bad, bad with names. And, you know, there, there are times when I'm really happy that, you know, I can remember the guy who I'm talking to. I mean, I'm not, if I, you know, it's not like, I can't remember like two seconds later, I can't remember their name, but sometimes, you know, you, when you're trying to remember the guy's name and you're going like, who's that guy's name? And, and then you, then it comes to you in a flash and you go, Oh yeah. And then you just feel all normal for a second. But for a little, for the longest time, you, you can't remember and you need, you need memory tricks. You need things that, that will give you, you know, an indication of, Oh, okay. So I'm doing that. I mean, like, for example, just in this, in the, the, um, single stick entradas. There's a bunch of stuff there that you just, you can't just say, well, you just do this number one, you just do number six, just do it. It's like, oh, okay. So not only are there certain principles that are being interpreted through that technique, but you, 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 you have, you can't, you can't just say, oh, okay, I'll do them anywhere because uh, there's some situations where it's against a 400 backhand. People say, well, that, what, that's just a 400 backhand. Yeah, that's 50% of your technique, either forehand or backhand. So you can't just say, well, I'll just do it this way because it doesn't work. Anyway, I've been going on too long. My, no, 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 my... no, that's fine. We got to... Um... No, there's a lot to unpack there, Phil. <laughs> I, I'd like to check Phil's uh, opinion on this theory. Phil, you remember Omar Hakim, right? Absolutely. Yeah, very, I very still owe him money. Guy. So if you see him, tell him I know I owe him money, okay? <laughs> okay. He left. He, he, he dis disappeared from my existence and... 
you know, I guess a lot of other people I know disappeared from their existence as well. So if you know how to get a hold of him, please. I don't, but he's out there okay. somewhere, I've heard. Okay. But anyway, Omar's a very sharp guy. He's a computer programmer. He installed, um, I think, all the computers on a military base somewhere. I mean, very, very sharp guy. He noticed that, and something we saw, Leo would give you all this great technique. And you'd ask him about the C. You know, how many times did Leo say to you, Oh, you must learn to forget, learn to forget. And he wasn't saying forget the technique. What he meant was that I, I finally figured out after a while, the, the, the sequence of the technique is not important. This being number three and that being number eight are not important. Yeah, except the if you remember the sequence. <laughs> Now, Omar's theory is, yeah, Omar's theory is that when, except for the opposite error, maybe some of the basics, what Leo got from his grandfather were sets under a theory. So he didn't get 12 techniques in the first set of Sagittas. He got Sagittas on Largo Sagittas. And it might have been 10 there. It might have been 50 there of just grandpa playing with you on Largo Sagittas, all the variations that would pop out of grandpa's head to show you an overview of how this theory with, with these tools could be used. Okay, here's a, here's a framing hammer. Framing hammer is different than a finishing hammer. Okay. Here's how you use a framing hammer right in front of you, upside down, this way, that way. You know, all the different ways you use a framing hammer, it's still a framing hammer. So Largo Sagittas is still Largo Sagittas. Same for every, all the other advanced stuff. When he got to the U.S. with this linear thought process that the Westerners have, he said, you know what? I got to give them numbers. They want to know technique one, two, and three. So I'm going to give them technique one, two, and three. So that's why a lot of people got things a little differently depending on when they trained with him. Uh, for instance, the Waco Toto, when I learned it from Leo, it was a drill on simply the, the concept, the structure of the drill was you can hit the guy in the hand or the body, but you don't make stick-to-stick -stick contact or weapon-to-weapon -weapon contact, and obviously he can't hit you. So you have to avoid him uh, and hit him without getting hit and without making weapon-to-weapon -weapon contact. And the way I learned it, Wego Toto means like everything goes with the whole thing, something like that. But you tell me, Ir Irwin learned a specific structure to that technique, which I find really interesting. I'm going to have to talk to him about that next time I speak to him. Uh, and then some things, um, you mentioned the 81 camp where we were doing the first uh, set of spotted dagger attacks and disarms. Don't feel too bad about if the disarms look different. Because uh, sometime after I started PTI, I actually restructured the disarms. Me and Tom Bezier hated the way disarms were. We had a hard time remembering which was one, which was two. So I went and I, I actually took the disarms from the first set of Spotted Dagger and just superimposed it on the numbering of the, of the solo disarms. Um, so the technique is the same, but just the numbering of it is different than what you'll see on that old video. You should have the new video. I thought I sent you all well, my spotted dagger videos. I, 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 I actually don't remember because the you know there was an awful lot of stuff in those days. I remember the reason we're talking about spotted dagger. There was there was yeah, in the eighty eight camp. Phil and I were there, and I, we were actually roommates at that camp. And Leo was going into the first set, probably the second set of attacks, and he got up to number four or five and just stopped. Somebody at that camp did something he didn't like, and he just shut down. And uh, I, we didn't end up getting that the rest of the set until he came to my. Uh, I was living in an apartment back then, eighty-eight. He came to my apartment, and the apartment had access to the roof, but it was a, it was a roof in a two-story house of just, you know, one person could could, I could not stand up in there. So Leo would go, and he gave me the rest of the set. He would do a number. And then I would go and trade places. He'd stand in the stairwell and correct me as I do that number. And then back and forth. And that's how I learned the second set. And I, I sent you that set. I know it definitely sent you the second set. But anyway, so Omar's, I, I, I digress. Omar's theory was uh, that the old guys, and you hear this a lot from a lot of students, at least Western students of Filipinos, teachers from that generation is, they could correct your body mechanics. They tell you the technique is right or wrong, but they had a real hard time saying which was number three, which was number eight, whatever. Um, 
because they did not learn it like that. They learned it as concepts or theories. Um, like there's no real reason that letter A has to be the first letter of our alphabet and B is a second. You can mix up the mix them all up and it'll still function as no, long as you know the rules of spelling and syntax and grammar. Yeah, well, then, but I think Does that, that makes sense to you. That Phil? makes sense. That makes sense. But it, I also am realizing that, you know, when it comes to stuff like that, you know, GT comes from a society that English was, or Spanish in this case, was a second language. It wasn't, it was Tagalog. It was, they, they had their, their, you know, squiggly dot stuff that they, that mm. was, was much more. But because, you know, as somebody's mentioning as they said, yeah, but since he was then teaching some Westerners, you know, to, to teach the dot, the squiggly dots, the, the system would not have worked very well because they would have never been able to remember it. But they could remember yeah. A, B, C, D, because, you know, when you comes down to it, it's just a, it's just a bunch of curves and lines and straights forwards. And, you know, and as long as you can yeah. overwhelm the person's ability to, to accept what you're doing, you, ha you can actually apply that stuff very well. Um, one of the guys, I'm trying to remember who it was, but Leo, when he was teaching us the um, alphabeto, he said originally it was based on Babayan. He said Philippine language. Mm -hmm. Now I found Babayan. Uh, but he said it looked like Sanskrit. He meant Babayan. Uh, but it was originally uh, like anting anting. You would attack the guy with the word kill. You would attack the guy with the word die. Right? And then he said someone, I always assumed it was Conrado, Change it to Western letters to make it more practical. And there's a little bit at the end there, you know, you do that backhand jab whip mm -hmm. at the end of like the dot, they would say the dot at the end of each letter. Uh, that was like the, the holdover of uh, maybe about buying the letter that's not in, there's no way to do it in English. So that was it there. But anyway, someone, I, I want to say it was either Eric Knauss or Mark Denny. It was one of the California guys was helping Leo at a seminar around 80 or 81 in California. And it was a big group of, of a whole bunch of other Philippine martial arts guys all on the West Coast. Uh, we're doing all their demos. And, and this guy said, well, we in our art, this is our alphabeto. And he's doing a set of alphabeto. And you know, obviously different, different system. And then uh, Eric or Mark, whoever it was, asked him, um, Let's be the church to have that. Oh, yeah, sure. We got that. And on the elevator ride from the lobby up to wherever floor they're going, uh, you see a little going. Right. And the theory is either Leo was remembering what his grandfather had translated or with Leo, this is absolutely equally, equally likely. Leo did the translation in his head on the freaking elevator ride from one floor to another. Yes, I, I, good. I, it's not I, just I, waving I, in the I, air. It's good technique. I, sp speaking of that, the, the technique of um, the Chiquetti, uh, the Floretti Chiquetti, I've noticed I was actually going through some stuff that I had, and I realized that five and six and seven and five and six and eight and nine were exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, how do I do this? So I, I, I went through and I said, I know what, I'm going to check Bill's stuff. So I went to your stuff and I said, he changed it too. He's changed, taken the, it's the, the, the one, two, three, that's four. Possible. That's five, the one six, I practiced a lot. Eight, seven, eight. Yeah. Then nine, 10 was exactly the same. Okay. And then you all go, right. you realize, and then all of a sudden you end up 90 degrees from where you're supposed to start, you know, compared to every other form in Pikiti. And you go, aha. And so I realized, that the you know that you know that basically it was okay. We do it like this, and then we we do it. But it's the the problem is, of course, you know when it comes down to people doing forms, because you know forms are not necessarily anything there other than just to hold the baseline of information. But if you're if, if you're not devices, yeah. So yeah. if you if if you hey guys uh, guys yeah. yes, we're, we're coming up on an hour, and we still got. Okay. Well, then we, Sorry. We, we oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. You get two old guys you talk. Started, we're going to want Okay. No, no, no. No worries. No worries. I mean, it's honestly it's great content, but I just want to make sure we get everything in. Otherwise, if we had 10 hours, I would just let you guys do your thing. Uh, so, on Jared, um, a question from Morgan. And you guys, you know, obviously, kind of Um, How do you deal with 
and slow the flow of firehouse information syndrome that sometimes suffer with a brand new student? <laughs> That's an interesting, I made my mutes off, yep. <laughs> That's an interesting dynamic because, um, you, know, when, uh, you know, as you teach seminars, you have to deal with that uh, kind of, um, that, dy that, that complicated dynamic often. You've got people that will attend a seminar that, have been training for years and then you've got someone that's their first time showing up to a Pekita Tosha training event. And so, um, and so trying to find that, that a balance of how do I deal with this? And um, for me, it, I, I, the way that I kind of work my way through that is I'll always begin. Uh, and I'm talking specifically about that type of a training event, because if I've got you know the luxury of bringing someone into my weekly classes or something of that nature, I can maybe handle that a little bit uh, differently. But in a, in a, in a shorter period of instruction, I'm, I'm big on fundamentals. You know, as we spoke about earlier, fundamentals are you know, uh, the most important part of the uh, fundamentals win fights. And I even avoid the word basic as much as possible. It slips out every now and then. But because yeah, say yeah, basic, yeah. people are like, hey, I, that's, the, that's the basic stuff. I want to learn the advanced stuff, you know. And so I like to say fundamentals. And um, so I'll always start with some kind of fundamentals where people and, and but a different spin on it. So you, you, even the advanced guys, they're basically doing the same stuff they've already done before, but in a different way. And so you're just kind of giving it to them in a way that's you know, that that is still kind of challenging mentally, physically. But it's basically just another spin on the same material. And so go through some fundamentals that hopefully kind of keeps everyone happy. And at that point, that's for me, that's the observation time. Also, I get a chance to look at the people in the group and say, Based on their mechanics, you know, you can you can immediately say, tell, hey, this guy's been training, and this guy, there's, this is completely new to this individual, and you can start to scale how you present the rest of the material based on that. And then for me, again, it's just about um, finding um, engaging ways to present the same material, but in uh, in, in, a, in a different way, so that again, the advanced guys are getting a, a new spin on stuff that they already know, and it keeps them happy, keeps them training, keeps them getting better at some of those skill sets. But there's something that the newer guys can keep up with. You know, it's they they may have they may not that the newer the newer guys may not get the have the luxury of seeing how it might be presented more traditionally, but at least they're getting those fundamental skills and and just an, another way, another spin on how it might be presented more traditionally. And and that's kind of it's it's a it's a tough balancing act because you again, especially when you're doing seminars, because you want to keep everyone in that group happy you want to keep them learning they want to keep them engaged and that's it's kind of a challenge but for me it's just finding new ways to to present essentially some of the same material and that way again everyone's happy okay if i could i'll, I'll give a brief history and then i want to get the input of the other two ones on this is what i did my first seminar leo sent me out to a seminar in california in november of 1979 he had been there in june of 79 doing a seminar at Fred Bandelon's uh, Kajikempo School. They wanted him back in November. He already had something, so they sent me. The, the June of 79 is when he met Guru Dan, by the way. Interesting story there. But what do I teach, Leo? What do I teach? I'll give them five attacks. Give them five attacks. And that became my go-to whenever he would send me for a seminar. And I was kind of his follow-up guy. He would do something, do a seminar, and they, they wanted him back. But he had something already booked, he would send me, right? For, that was kind of my thing in the early 80s. And so I would do five attack subsystem. Start with that. If they were able to get through that, then I would build on that. Uh, and then when I started PPI, uh, actually before around 1990, I said, let me, what can I do in the basics that will be easy to pick up um, and get them fighting faster than going through the 64 attacks or the obsidario and the things that I started with or even Leo started with. So I took the four cuts, four diagonals out of the five attacks and because most weapon arts have those four diagonals and made the fifth attack X and X equals what is not a diagonal. So it was algebraic. The impression I get, Phil and Jared, from seeing how Leo developed the uh, Tri-V formula is he was doing a similar thing. Get a really compact system that you could add or subtract to that should give the people to get them fighting quickly um, without giving them, you know, all the words in the dictionary, but enough words to get a, a debate. 
If, Does that if make I sense? Could chime, chip, yeah, if I could chime in on that just real quick, because this is something that you know a lot of people know of kind of you know the, the dynamic they they uh, it's interesting for them as us as instructors is that those those relationships between you know dosa methodos and some of the older ways of training methodologies and then the, the tri V. And for me, and it kind of re just reiterating what you just you just mentioned to him, Bill, is that the um uh, you know, and I like to compare it to this, you know, if, if I'm going to learn and, and I like to compare it to language and a lot of times we use that term, we've got the alphabet and we've got words and sentences and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, when, when I learned Tagalog, um, I, I learned it first for two months from a book or from books. And then I went to the Philippines and started, I, I studied the language and I learned, you know, the alphabet and then I learned how to put words and grammar structure together. And then when I learned to speak Portuguese, I, 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 to this day, I couldn't tell you that I know the alphabet, but I speak the language. And so I learned it by just using words, you know, just, just speaking and not taking that, that academic approach to it. And I like to compare it to the two, you know, I, uh, uh, the, the tri -V methodology, there isn't really a, an alphabet. There is no, um, like a lot of the Filip traditional martial arts, Filipino martial arts that I've studied before, you've got, you know, your eight or your 12, those are com common numbers that are utilized to learn your, 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 your base set of skills. Whereas, you know, in the way that I teach the tri is the way that I was taught it, where I wasn't really taught an alphabet, just like you said, I was taught um, some fighting, um, I was taught some words, some combinations, some fighting um, combinations. And, but those, those base combinations are made up of all four of those diagonal attacks that we just, you just mentioned. And so there's, you know, but they're just, they're, they're put together in three count um, attack combinations. And so you've learned a few com fight combinations, but within the context of that, you already have what the closest thing we, we, we would have to an alphabet is that five attack subsystem. And so uh, it's kind of that more, like you said, learning to f learning some fight combinations a little bit quicker. I'm learning words and how to speak the language before I've even learned the alphabet. Later on, you should go back and learn that alphabet and, and a little bit of grammar structure so that it helps, it just enriches your ability to speak that language. But it's just kind of that approach is kind of how I like to articulate some of the differences between more of a, that, you know, the, the tri -V and, and the methodology and some of the older methodologies like uh, the Dose Methodist. Phil, you're our bridge between old and new. <laughs> how would you, how would you uh, put it? The, uh... Well, what, what the, the old school of teaching and the, the newer methods? Well, the, the newer methods, I mean, the, the Dosi Methodos is, I think, the, the key to most of this stuff. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's really, it's there. I, I can see why or how Grant Tuan took the material and made it more palatable. Because the one, once you have mastered something so completely, it's easy to take something out and make it look easy for you to do. And therefore easy for somebody to learn and not necessarily have it, you know, as complete as something the old, but sometimes, you know, sometimes the old stuff, like for example, you may have, if you're, if you're trying to put new piping into an old house, you might have to rip out every wall before you get it. Whereas if you do a new wall, you just sort of say, oh, okay, I'm not going to have it. I'm not, I'm not going to run it. We have our bathtub over here and upstairs we have the other bathtub right here. So I'm just going to run the pipe in here and run up the wall, and then I'm going to close it in with stuff. And you you have you have your bath, two bathrooms and your kitchen, and they're all close together. And so you don't actually have to run the pipe. But if if you have a you know, if you have one of those fancy apartments where you have a bathroom in every room and you have all these other things, you're going to have to run a lot more pipe. And so that's kind of how I, that's the analogy I use in in dealing with this because you know the the problem is with uh you know with, with the material it's like i've noticed like one of the things about the the, the tri v that i've noticed is that it has all those uh loading positions like the it has the head you know top load the the, the crown load and then you have the shoulder load then you have the side load and then you have the download and a lot of people have taken this material and they've said oh okay so this is the real material and you realize this is just Hoego Toto. It's just Hoego Toto, Hoego Torado. This is the way that they would structure the material. And this way it was structured in like 1982 or 83 when uh, GT had moved to Texas. The problem was that this is, you know, I mean, he is he is, has the capacity to adjust it anyway. I mean, we've all been there. We've all had, seen him do stuff. You know, he'll just start doing knife stuff and you'll go, well, where's that from? And you'll realize that, if you actually had the contextual reference point back to its beginning, it may, you know, you may be able to say, oh, okay, it should go here. 
And, you know, I've been practicing this stuff for, you know, going on 44 years. It's kind of scary to realize that. But uh, mm -hmm. actually, you know, it's 40 years that I've been doing this stuff. But you just realize after a while that, okay, I've been doing this for 40 years. That doesn't mean anything. But you start realizing that if you don't have the contextual reference points, then, you know, you're, you're just as, you know, alone in your boat as anybody else is that, that is learning it. You know, so I, I, my, my, should we say my beef with the system, because I think that the, the system is, uh, you know, is a really great system. But the, my beef with the system is that we are not given an awful lot of the building blocks. We're kind of having to, okay, so we find, so if you happen to like, I know that you must have found some of, of your own building blocks uh, to unbuild. Then, so you have a certain way of doing things, and you, to Andrea, you have, you know, you've you've made your own building blocks because you've taken the material. Because I know I have, I've I've made my own forms or my own techniques because these are the things that I have described to myself as being the most important, and I have my justifications. And it just you start realizing after a while that, okay. This this works, but I mean, we really shouldn't have to invent the wheel every time we go out there. Yeah, I was I was talking to the guys. I don't know if you heard this point I made. Uh, when when I was learning, when you were learning, Leo was running a medical school teaching us how to be doctors. From the 1990s on, he is more of an emergency room doctor. You come into him with a specific problem, and he'll fix that problem. You got a broken broken bone. Or you're in the military. How do I design a short course for military people? Boom, boom, boom. How do we design a short course for law enforcement people? Have a different set of rules, different rules of engagement. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, it's a physically big system. But your point about everyone doing it a little differently. Me and Tom Biggio learned Sagitas exactly the same time. I mean, side by side in the same room from Leo. And I remember... You know, we emphasize different things on it. And part of it probably is uh, he was always a much better athlete than me. Um, and Leo would show us the two ways of doing the jab and we call it a jab. But it was, to me, the thing that stuck in my mind was the corkscrew thrust because that prevented me from getting sloppy and too wide. Tom does a perfect jab and doesn't need that... Uh, that extra help to keep things in line because under stress, Tom can keep a perfect jab. Uh, so I tend to teach my guys the corkscrew thrust first as a jab for number one. Mm -hmm. So that under stress, and some of them are probably not as good athletes as Tom, they will wind up with a good jab if the corkscrew, screw thrust, th corkscrew thrust gets sloppy. Another example, uh, we learned the second set at, uh, at the same time. And I remember I, the first time we learned it, we learned it together. Second time, I got it from Leo somewhere else. I forget where. But I couldn't make heads or tails of my notes. And I had a hard time at number six. And I couldn't read my own night notes on number six. Uh, I got together with Tom. And I ended up using his version of number six. And I changed the way we did it in PTI because his version was better. Uh, and it made sense. You could explain why you're doing these techniques this way, this way, this way. Um, so, I mean, the the the, the dose methodos is there. It's see, I, I've, I, I'm not trouble with the, the terminology, but when when uh, Leo had the old uh, AAO Honest American Organization, and the, well, he started that in '76, and I remember in '76 or '77 getting. Uh, one version of Dulce Marthados list, and then a second version like six months later. And one had the Dulce Marthados list one through 12, and it was all the solo uh, material. And then another version had, had um, took away some of the names on the solo and it had double A, uh, spotted dagger, dagger, mono and mono. And there's another way of seeing now, I have it on my blog post. I think that may have been. Somebody got that from Tom, um, but it was a different way, and, and AA is not there at all, and they have the other weapons. So um, I'm pretty sure Leo's grandfather used the term dos but it was it was it was never fixed in stone, at least when I was seeing it back in those early days in the 70s. 
Um, so, like, and, and you probably remember this, Phil. When when we got sixty four tax, the the drills of uh, Sagitas and Sagang Labo were were drills for Sagitas. The first um, break in break out was a drill from first and second set. Sagang Labo was a drill to train third set. Um, Contratus was a drill. The Contratus was doing sixty four tax was a drill uh, for uh, Contratus of the the five attacks drill. You see in in breaking in probably sixty four tax was a drill for um, Contratus. Um, the Florette were not part of sixty four tax. We were taught at the same time, but that was a separate piece. It wasn't included in sixty four because. The 64 is just a name. He put the form, the, the drills and everything. We we're learning for those first three years after 76. He wanted, we had a, a tournament and he wanted a form for the forms competition. Just numbered everything. That's why the numbers in the 64 tax forms are kind of odd. You see just the first half of one drill and not the second half. You see both sides, but not all the variations, et cetera. But um, he had a lot more emphasis on the name Dose Mathados after the 90s when he moved back to the Philippines. I'm not sure simply being back in the Philippines may have done that. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what he actually got from his grandfather and the way he got it is really hard to pin down. I mean, I remember some stories him doing break and break out with his grandfather in, in a full moon and he hit his grandfather and it bounced back and hit him in the forehead. I felt wetness on his face. He said, I'm really sweating. And he looked, there was blood. It's in the black and the moonlight. Um, I remember a lot of specific stories about certain things, but when he got wrong, it was really hard to tell. He would say that the grandfather and the brothers would go out and, you know, between planting and harvest, they got downtime on the farm. So one guy would go there, train with this guy. One guy would go there, spar with that guy and bring it back and put it in the laboratory. You know that story. It's told it a thousand times. And to me, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm assuming that that's why different pieces of the church look so different because it came from different places and it may have been filtered through different guys. I don't know if all these brothers were the same size. I doubt very much they were the same personality. And I've seen, like me and Tom and, and Erwin learned at the same time from Leo saying things and we kind of express things very differently. Um, the only thing I've ever been able to get of a history is, according to Tim Wade, talking to the old people when he was in the uh, Philippines in the 90s, that the uh, seven attacks came from Panay, and it was originally done with two long straight double swords, with a double sword technique. And it was the two cuts down over that, that idea of cutting kind of zigzag down the body, which were tiles liked, and they applied it to solo. Uh, and it works much better, obviously, with sword. You're, you're cutting the femorals on the inside or the knee tendons. Uh, but you can still do out balancing with a stick. But that's the only real thing that we've ever heard about pinpointing where Conrado got a piece of the system. Um, I've seen some things in the Dosni Paris uh, when, when Conrado. Uh, one of the Cunetes came to our tournament in 77 or 78 in the demo. And the last three disarms, the one where you're doing the wraps on first set of spotted dagger disarms, he did something very, very similar. And I'm wondering if that is, um, you know, one of the older parts of the system. You know, it always struck me as odd. Why are you wrapping a sword, you know? Uh, but you see this in Spanish martial arts and Spanish historical martial arts. And one of the Hema guys told me that a, a big difference between this military sword and a civilian sword uh, is that a lot of times the military sword, even the, the rapiers, the bottom half of the blade was dull. So make, doing that wrap made perfect sense, especially if you got long wool clothing on like they had in, in Europe in most of the time period. Um, but, you know, you got to go to context um, and I, I'm, I'm making a very long story. I'm sorry, but I'm not sure. I was never able to pin down from Leo who got what when. I remember in '88, 
I had I had knowledge of what the whole system is, but I didn't know what it was. Uh, you know what the technique was at that point. I did by seventy nine by ninety nine. Yeah, by eighty nine I had it. But I remember in eighty nine, eighty eight, and eighty nine, laying out the whole system of Leo in in a binder, and giving them three or four magic marker uh, markers, uh, underliners, highlighters, with different colors. Leo, can you highlight which was the original system that Conrado and his brothers got from his their father? And then what was the material that Conrado and his brothers developed? Because you how many times you heard the story at the library laboratory, they got the system and they got the system from their father and they tried to def destroy the father's technique, which was really revolutionary for anywhere in Asia, right? And then they put it to the laboratory. What worked stayed, what didn't work, they threw out, got something new from outside the system, put it in there. Okay, now this Leo, with this highlighter, I'd like you to, to highlight the things that you developed. Oh, not important, not important. And I did that once in, at the 88. I would I spent the week at the camp with, when Phil was there, and then a week at his house. And then 89, uh, I wasn't able to get the week of the camp off. I was relatively new at my job. So I spent two weeks at his house. I, I, I showed up the, the day of the, uh, oh, the dinner, awards dinner. I showed, I showed up right at night on the last day. But both times, Leo, what did Conrado's dad give them? What is Conrado and the brothers developed? And what did you develop? Oh, it's not important. I think a lot of it was developed by Leo, but he would never say anything was developed by him because that culture, the older it is, uh, the the better. And he had a huge amount of respect for his grandfather. I mean, I mean, if you remember the story of how he ended up living with his grandfather, you know, that, that's pretty heart rending. Um, so, you know, I, I, to this day, I don't know how much Leo developed himself um, and how much he may have simply structured it because grandpa threw a thousand techniques at him and he put his 12 favorite into a set. I don't know. I don't know. Hey guys, if you guys have been to the Philippines, more, if you guys have any insight, I'd love to hear it. Yes, sir. Yeah, we'll get, so we're, we're coming on an hour and a half and I got a. Uh, so we have to run through. Um, okay, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. no, 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 no. I mean, people love it. And believe me, if we had, uh, I mean, I could, we could make another episode of this without an issue. Um, so, two more. Uh, okay, guys, let's let's do this. Let's kind of um, with a half hour left. Well, yeah, let's rapid. I don't want to say rapid fire, but let's um, let's go. Okay, uh, two on Jared. Um, what do you look for students that you're about to promote to instructor? And this tie kind of ties in with Morgan's question on um, how, uh, how it's the responsibility of the Lacan guru to prepare the students and the fundamentals and, and all that. As far as material, if they were to go to seminar, at least they would have some semblance what they're doing and what have you. Um, so I guess with tying Morgan's question, what do you personally look for when you're about to promote students to instructor? And then we can get to the other two lines today. Yeah, there's, there's three things that I'll always emphasize there. Um, and people that, you know, train, train with me know this. It's, and essentially it's all summed up under skill, knowledge, and character. Those are the three things I'm looking at, right? Um, knowledge of the system, the skill and performance of the art. And they can have all of that, but if they're just not a good person, they're not really someone I want uh, to be promoting through the art also. Yeah. So yeah. Um, good, 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 solid character also. So those, the, those three things are kind of to sum it up are, are, are what I'm looking for. Skill, knowledge, and character. Okay. Tuan, Tuan uh, Phil, what do you look for when you're about to promote somebody to instructor? Well, okay. We've, we've basically uh, recreated, not recreated, we've basically created a PTK Canada for that very purpose because the problem is that you can be very personally involved with somebody and realize that they're absolutely the wrong person for what they want to do and you 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 know do you really want to be that person to say wow you don't suck but you're definitely not what we want and mm -hmm. it's very hard to it's very hard when when you have a personal relationship with somebody to do that you can bring them up to a high level, but you, you, you may not want them to, to uh, 
to interact mm-hmm. with people on that level. So mm-hmm. you have to, you know, so you, you I actually, that's one of the reasons why I mean, I'm sure, you know, Jared has a, a very strong organization and there's a whole lot of people. I mean, it's not like he's not the person who makes a decision. He has a whole lot of people that make, that help him make this decision. And mm-hmm. so that is an, an enormous weight off his shoulders, even though he probably feels the weight of every time he does that. Because if you have somebody who thinks that they're really good and, you know, they're, they're missing a couple of pieces because, you know, you, you have to, you have to create a situation where, you know, you not so much indemnify yourself from it, but you actually have to, you, you have to say to yourself, okay, so I have to create a bunch of stuff so that if this person becomes an instructor, that it's not really my stamp of approval, it's the association stamp of approval. And so therefore, you know, if you have to come back and say, by the way, uh, the association actually now believes that, you know, you cannot maintain this at this level and mm-hmm. or you can't you you are at you are at your, you know, to quote the Peter principle, you're at your level of incompetence you, because and unfortunately, there's a there are a lot of people out there who, you know, who seek this material and, you know, and I'm, you know, they, they really seek this material and it's very hard. When you're looking, you know, there's an, a saying I think they use in Navy SEALs, you don't train till you get it right, you take, train till you don't get it wrong. Mm-hmm. And if there's some people who are willing to do that kind of training, and eventually you realize that, gosh, they're not the people I want. And it takes time to, to actually accept that fact. And so you kind of need a, a structure where you can say, okay, so you know and if you fulfill this you know you you can even give them an instruction level but just hold off the the golden handshake type of thing say okay you are you know yes you're an instructor but you can only ever teach these people because i mean i think that's the biggest problem with uh you know with an art like bikini it's uh you know it has an awful lot of doors to get really really good and you can become really really good and really really bad at something at the same time so I think that's uh, that's kind of what we're doing. We're we're creating, uh, you know. I mean, of course, character is there, but you know, it's if you want if you want to, uh, you know, sometimes you miss character because you're, you know, or you you'd rather have characters and skill. Mm-hmm. Because, you, you know, you 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 know, sometimes people, you know, think, well, okay, I hope they get better, but you know, I would like to I'd like them to, to be a nicer person or a better person. You can't always guarantee that, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. To on Bill? I would say the sheer volume of technique is at least the way I teach. The sheer volume of technique is a weeding out process that that, that the uh the bad people mm-hmm. tend not to be able to have patience. Uh to a certain extent. Sometimes it's personality types of the, the most natural hardcore fighters have the hardest time with the most complex technique. And they'd rather just run in there and boom, because they can. Uh, but having said that, I, I took out a uh, knife and made it a separate thing as opposed to here's the knife variations on this technique as a safety factor. Um, and the rest of the stuff, I don't see people getting in too much trouble with, you know, okay, they, they learned a set of Sagittas. Um, I don't see people getting in too much trouble with that. Uh, a bad guy with bad intent could get in a lot of trouble learning the small knife stuff. Mm. Um, so my weeding out process is simply this your volume of material. As far as instructors... Uh, you know, my my mission statement in PTI uh, from the early days was was very much to put out pediatric instructors. And it's kind of a uh, it's supposed to be a, a an instructor school. It's a medical school to put out doctors. Mm. Um, you know, uh, some guys Leo would train for tournaments. Some guys Leo would train to do X, Y, or Z. Um, and I, I, Leo would joke with me, especially after after uh, there was some, he would tell me a lot, and I'm sure he said it to a lot of people. Oh, you know, the only, the only, the only one I've given this technique to, and you know, we, we like the president and the vice president. We're not allowed to, on the same airplane at the same time because if the plane goes down, the technique is lost. You know, I'm sure he said that to everybody. 
But um, I really, when I started PTI, I made it my mission to put out really as good as I could, good quality detention instructors who knew everything I knew and then could, their job was to take it a step further. Okay. Um, Cause I'm just one guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, there were, there's, there's certain sets that uh, I had the first and second set. Uh, I wanted a third list. I said, well, you'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. And I didn't figure it out until I had my guys go through those two, this is spear set. Uh, they, they, which is first, the chicken and the egg, Sagitas or the spear set, I don't know, but they, they look like each other. And there's some things in Sagitas that works a lot better when you do it in spear. So I'm, I kind of wonder if spear came first, but the third set, we in spear, it's spear versus not a sword. In the in Sagitas, it, I, I've come to understand it as a weapon retention set. You've smacked the guy's hand, he's lost his stick, and he's charged and tries to smother you. And and then it makes a whole lot of sense as a as a strict grappling set, set when someone's trying to smother you, you have a stick and they don't, then everything in there makes a lot of sense to me. But anyway, but I did not teach that until I had a group of guys who all knew all three sets of Sagitas. And then it was in one of the camps we had in Zach Wilson's backyard that I taught the first two sets of spear. I said, okay, guys. You all got Sagittas. It comes from Sagittas or vice versa. I don't know. But help me. We're going to develop the third set now of spear. And I know conception is supposed to be spear versus sword. And all the guys helped me with it. I could not have done that by myself. Mm. You know, just, I, you know, um, you know, the, the times where I got told to do things by myself, I don't think came out that good. If you look at the Obsidario de Mano, the reverse slap and the reverse hack set look like redheaded stepkids and everyone else has black hair. So I got the, the forward set and Leo said, okay, you'll figure out the second set, the reverse set. And I was, you know, just, okay, you're doing this. And, and, and that's why there's weird things like, like hitting with the left hand, you know, switching over, which you don't see in the other sets. Uh, you know, he gave it to me at the uh, 89 uh, class. And it, it's really, it doesn't fit with the other stuff. It doesn't really look good. I've been trying for years to have somebody fix it. Um, so, um, what was that? How was I in this thought? Anyway, I don't, I'm not the be all and the end all. My idea was when I started PTI is I get as many people as possible to know the whole system. And then their job is to go to take it to the next level. Like there's no, there's no, you know, the ground grappling right from Leo was you pin the guy on the ground you break his arm or do it and you get out of there. You don't want to stay on the ground long yeah, right. because you're number two and three or jumping on your back yeah, with knives. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I got a lot of people who have really good ground game. You know, they're the ones who are really, you know, dealing with it stick to stick on the ground, ground stick grappling, you know, how to deal with things on the ground. Leo did a lot of that when we moved back to the Philippines, bringing the uh, Dumag and the uh, Buno guys. I forget what the names are. But my, but my feeling was, you know, you guys know me. I'm a very conservative Republican, free market, and capitalist guy. You, you have them graduate school. They have their PhD. And then they go out in the free market of ideas. And eventually, this guy's going to be known as, okay, this guy's good in solo. This guy's really the guy to see in AA. This guy's the guy to see in Spotted Dagger. This guy, if you want to go to tournaments. This guy, if you want to teach law enforcement people. And, and you know, let the... Let the free market work its magic, and everyone's going to have different skill sets, different personalities, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Different backgrounds that can feed into the church and, and make it work better. So I never believed, you know, I have to, I'm the, the God's gift to get a church. You know, I'm, I'm just the museum curator. Yeah. I know it's a weird word, but, you know, I'm the guy who's going to, Show you what I got, and then you're to use your job, next generation of students to make the improvements. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, next question. Um, I get this. Um, okay, you hear different systems. Somebody put it. Some put a twenty-year mark. Uh, so, two on Jared. Some put a twenty-year mark on like. Okay, you know you you're eligible for two on twenty years. I think Sayak Atienza, if I'm not mistaken. I do that. Um, However, what Leo told me. Uh, so, 
but then I, I you hear other systems have gotten it sooner. I mean, I obviously have no dog in this fight. I'm just curious: is there kind of is is there other factors you look at besides years of tenure? Um, come on, Jared, let's say you on that. Yeah. So, I mean, <clears throat> when it comes to ranking and whatnot, I um, I. I don't have any specific years per se um, that uh, that you know that we will utilize, but I do um, always recall one of the things that Graham Tuhon has would, would always say that has become kind of I guess the underlying philosophy that we utilize, which is um, you know it's not the number of years, it's the number of hours, and uh, it's something that I, I, I recall him saying often. And mm. and if you kind of look at that, you know, I started doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in '96. If I had trained consistently over that time. And I and I I'm a blue belt level after 20 you know what is that 27 yeah. years so I I didn't I haven't trained it that long but I you know I I dabble in it when I'm in Brazil I'll train so I, I dabble in it every now and then but I'm a blue belt level after 27 years so I you know that's that's kind of one example of you know of how that and so and then another thing that you know that Grant Tuhon would always you know that, and I asked him specifically these these questions about you know uh, grading and whatnot and. One of the other philosophies that we'll follow is, and this the way that he articulated it to me, and then I took it to heart and uh, and, and abide by the same philosophy is, you know, if if you if if you studied at one university, and you decided, hey, I'm going to move to another university, well, many of your credit hours will go with you to that new right. school. Sure. Some of them might not. The school might not recognize some of those credit hours. You know, maybe depending on what university it was, maybe all of them are recognized. And so um, he kind of used that analogy, and I and I use the same thing. If people, if someone comes into Piketty, you know, Piketty Tersha, and they're they've been training, you know, uh, Filipino martial arts, for example, for the last twenty years, well, they're probably going to pick up things pretty good, depending and, and particularly depending on what Filipino martial art it was, they may pick it up really fast. It may be just a matter of learning the curriculum. They may have all the, mm. you know, a lot of the stuff down already. And whereas if they came from you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or, or something like that, that is quite a different martial art. They're still going to have a great fundamental, a great, great foundation in certain um, things, but maybe not everything is going to be directly translatable. So, um, you know, so we'll take the credit hours, you know, based on where they might be as an individual, not be too strict on the number of years, but more what what's what, what skill level they're at, they're, they're at, and then, you know, what has come with them, and then the number of hours that they put into that, uh, one of the things, two other things that we'll do um, within you know the PTTA is what we one is what we call a lateral rank recognition program. So if someone comes to us and they through a, a different Piketty tertiary organization have already been ranked at you know whatever it might be, say they're Mata Asanaguro, and now they've come to us. Well, you know they're they're a high level uh, instructor you know, and we've verified it based on what organization they've come from, and but they don't know our curriculum. Well, as soon as they can demonstrate our curriculum. Then we will automatically recognize the lateral rank. Oh, so right. there are, we, you know, we recognize your rank in our organization mm -hmm. also because you also know our curriculum. So will you have a? And then we have another program that we call a fast track program, where, for example, I've got an Inosanto Kali instructor who is, you know, has got great mechanics, got a lot of skill. Um, he's a recognized and 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 uh, a certified instructor, but it's not Pikiri Tersha. Well, we'll we'll put them in a fast track program where they may have a, they may not need to wait six years from Yakan Isa to Lakan Guru, but which is where we kind of look at a, a typical time frame uh, for some of this kind of training on a regular basis where um, it may be uh, a lot faster, just a matter of, you know, the, whether they can demonstrate the, the skill, the knowledge and the character. And so we're kind of different programs that we'll do, but we don't not too strict on, on certain things based on certain criteria. Well, that's neat. That's neat how you do that. Um, depending on their background, their experience, obviously their character. Um, wow, that's really neat. Huh, huh. Um, oh, okay. Do you want Phil? Um, again, do you use the twenty-year that's kind of thrown out there, or do you have your own criteria? Well, uh, quite honest. I mean, Tuan um, Jared is the only person in Bikini Tercia that has, uh, besides uh, Tuan Bill, who's actually created his own, uh, tu the, created Tuans under him. There are most of the people, but you know, there's a lot of other people who just kind of like give their suggestions to Tuan Gahe, and mm. he, he basically echoes that and they become Tuans. And last little while, there've been a bunch of guys who've been getting their Tuan level in uh, like a couple of years. So, and I, you know, I don't mean to denigrate it, 
but we kind of look at the Tuan level as more of like a regional manager thing. But don't you than, call that? Uh, don't you call that a new Han? A new Han. Well, yeah, that's, oh, that's new? described. Yes, that's, I've never that's, heard that. Uh, new Han. But, but, but a Tuan, a Tuan new is Han. basically a regional manager because there are some people who, you know, like I got promoted to Tuan in my first time or my first ranking was in what, 2000. And it, uh, you know, Tuan Bill had uh, received, I think, your first one in 94. So it was, you know, it was like six years afterwards, but it was, you know, at that time, you know, things were politically a lot different than they are now. Mm. And uh, then, you know, uh, about 2010, there was a, a, you know, a great, you know, I think that's around the, the same group of people that uh, when you got it, uh, Jared, it was like... 2000, yeah, it was 2010, 10, 10 11, okay. around that then, yeah. yeah. So, so there's a, there's a whole lot of people who got promoted at that time. And then lately, there's been more people promoted. So now we have... You know, uh, Tuan Jack Latore uh, puts uh, puts together a list and checks it with me. Uh, and uh, I've seen that. I've seen that list. There, there, there's a you know, there, there's upwards of fifty of us out there. And I, and I, I call our group the, the second batch, where the, you know the, the the two other two horns here that we have are what I call the first batch of two right. horns, and then and then 2010, where there was a group that were promoted to two horns. I call, I refer to us as the second batch, and then there's been subsequent you know sporadic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's, well, yeah, so I mean, I'm not, not, not one to, you know, I, I'm not casting aspersions. I'm just saying that this is historically what happened. And so the, we try not to, you know, we, we tried, we acknowledge the, the Hagdan level, you know, as in mm -hmm. within what they're doing. Uh, but, you know, we basically try not to, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not like we're trying to rebrand the idea of two on. It's just that, you know, Quite honestly, it's you know it. I don't really you know with you know there's some some exceptions, but with you know most of the new guys, you know, do they really know all that material? I mean, like I remember, you know, what what you must have had to learn in nineteen or to get in nineteen ninety four to get promoted to Tuhan. So, so you have seventy six. So you're almost twenty years there. Uh, so yeah, twenty years seems to be one the, year early. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so, yeah. uh, you know, and I, I got mine, I started in 81, so I got mine in 2000, so it was 19 years. Yeah, that's about, but that's as far as the time, the time frame that I've already heard of is kind of the 20 yeah. year mark, 19, obviously would be. Yeah, yeah. If, if I could, I could cut in real quick. Um, the rank chart you see in the, the PTI structure, I got from Leo and he said, I want this and this and this. And two on was supposed to be at the 20 year mark but it was a recognition you're supposed to get all the technique by matas to go master instructor um and what he told me was a lot uh, yakan is what they would call the the elementary school students when he's going to school the the principal of a school especially i think the principal of high school was known as a two on he would call his his principal of his, tuan, of his high school two on uh doing whatever his name was um, and that comes from the melee, uh, Lord or chief or, uh, kind of, a, um, I think it's literally Lord, but it's used like, you well, would like, use, a chief, like a chief, like a chief. Yeah. Like a chief. So, uh, it was a, it was an honorary rank to post them to signify the head of a school. So when Leo was the only two on, he was known as two on. Once he made me Tuon, he became Grand Tuon. Um, I'm, I'll post on my uh, timeline uh, the reason I put PTI, the structure, the way it was, was to keep politics out of rank. I wanted to keep things separate. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when I was learning, if Leo wants to say thank you to you, he would give you a knife or give you a plaque, things like that. He didn't promote you and give you a rank because you brought a lot of people to his seminar or he liked you. And I wanted to make sure that kept going with PTI. Um, a, a lot of the way I structured PTI was to keep everybody on the straight and narrow and no um, selling of rank and things like that. I'm not going to name names. <laughs> so... Uh, Get back, I promise. <laughs> um... So I'll post it on my timeline. Guys, read that. The people are listening to this. 
and and that'll give you a lot of history on things. You know, when in in my group, uh, we if we have a regional a, a seminar host, is called the director for the state. <laughs> it's it's different than, yeah, Paulo. <laughs> Mr. Diplomacy there, see, there's, there's Names, problem. names, yeah. names, names. Uh, <laughs> I want to keep rank separate from politics and commerce. So if you want to say thank you to someone, you know, if it's a seminar host, you know, that's a really important job. If you're trying to run a business doing this, make them the state director. Um, and then like to, to Jared's point of what happens if you get a guy come in who is already very good in his system, but it's a different system than the territory. So we have a certified trainers program. They are certified trainer, meaning their instructor's level skill at this one particular piece up to the territory. And that makes it easier for testing later on. You go through, oh, we've got nine out of 10 things as certified trainer level. What we got to really focus on is this test of what's left over. So uh, I, I, we're probably going to get off soon. So I'll, I'll post that link up on my site and, and try to throw it around a couple of other places so you guys see kind of what where I'm coming from on that. And I, 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 I know I talk a lot. I was, no, I, no, 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 no. And right. yeah, I, I was probably, well, probably definitely a little. So, uh, and then Greg Tuhan, when I started training with him, he kind of, you know, uh, recognized the time that I had spent with his uh, uncle Nene Total. And so I was a fifth, including that time, 15 years by the time that I was. So this will be my, I think I'm, you know, it was 11 years ago that I got my, um, Tuhan promotion, but it was 50, it was at a 15 year point that I was, uh, uh, promoted to Tuhon. So it was a little, little, little sooner um, than, uh, and I think I was probably lucky enough, fortunate enough that because he was doing a group of Tuhon in, uh, instruct, uh, uh, promotions at that time, that I was fortunate enough to be uh, around that group that was, and, uh, and he loved me in with that group also. Uh, yeah. All right, guys, we're coming up on two hours. So, all right, this has been absolutely wonderful. The comments speak for themselves about this. So again, uh, fantastic. All right, rapid fire. Okay. Uh, to on Jared, what changes in PTK community would you like to see? Um, in general, maybe just a little more. Um, uh, and and it's, I mean, things have things have I, uh, because of the pandemic. I think there's just been less activity in general. Things have kind of gotten a little chill. But um, I, I'd like to see just a little bit more. Um, uh group promotion and harmony you know because i've always been of the of the of the opinion that what you know what if, if i help the community to grow then that's going to be beneficial to the other piketty tertiary groups and organizations and vice versa well, and so sure. kind of you know what's what's good for the goose is good for the gander type of a type of an approach to yeah. to the, the arts so maybe a little less politics a little bit a little more um uh, harmony across the board um sure. i i you know i I teach my way, uh, and I and I and I teach it for a reason. But I want people to learn the way that Tuhan Philip and Tuhan Bill teach, also because, like we mentioned earlier, they have um, ways of teaching the art um, based on their uh, their strengths and their and their experiences and their their teaching methods that they other instructors won't get from me. And so I want them to enrich their learning experience by training from others also. And and you know each of the instructors that I've that, that I uh, the Tuhans that I've been around. And, and other instructors of different levels. Uh, there's a lot of great instructors out there. You can learn mm. from each of them. And if we all kind of, I think, just took that approach that um, we can we can really um, help to promote each other and it's good, going to be good for the art in general as, as one thing I'd like to see. Absolutely. I mean, right, taking account students' journey being most important, not putting them in the middle of politics and affecting their potential and journey. That's music. Yeah, that, that's uh, two on Phil. Uh, rapid question: What um, uh, what changes in what changes in community would you like to see uh, with regards to uh, specifically PTK community? What changes? Well, I I would like like to see as uh, you know, for example, uh, we are all. I mean, we've all got national organizations. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm nationally in Canada. I'm coast to coast. But that doesn't mean I've got like a million people. It means I've, I'm just I happen to have pieces on you know people teaching on one coast and the and on the other. Uh, but really, what I'd like to see is the the systems that are there 
being available to more people. I mean, for example, if you know, if you have a letter of introduction, if you you give a student a letter of introduction and you send them to a seminar, you know that they don't because I mean, we both know that you know if we have somebody who shows up at our at a seminar and we don't really know them that well, I mean, we may not treat them with the greatest welcome. It's not that we don't like them; it's just that we don't know them, and so. If uh, we, it'd be nice if, we're, well, one, one of the things I'm looking forward to being able to do is to really get to a graduate level and say, okay, so you can actually learn Ispada Daga from this person. You can actually learn Daga Daga from this person. You can actually learn an awful lot of the system and you, ne you don't necessarily need it. I mean, I'll tell you something, there's an awful lot of people out there who don't have anywhere near the whole system. It's, uh, you know, I mean, if you want to ask, I, I remember Tuan Bill, when he was first putting together the basics of this thing for himself, and then he had like all these things and he had, you know, all this material that he had to somehow translate from the written word into physical action. And, you know, I remember, I remember spinning to like being, being at his house, I, I would drive down, he did, he lives in, uh, or he lives in, uh, where, where is it you live, you live in, it's, it's Thing about Big Spring, but it's not Big it's Spring. Not, not. He, he lives in uh, in, a, in a little village. Well, now, now or... Oh, yeah, Fishkill. Okay. Yeah, Fishkill, New York. Fishkill, New York, which is, if I was to take the highway from Montreal, I would drive down to Albany, make a quick right, and go right down to New York City, and then I would pass by Fishkill. Anyway, he was, he was very nice. One day, he invited me to his house, and uh, I went down with a student of mine, and we spent all day from about, like I guess, 8 or 9 in the morning through to about 1 or 2 in the morning, you know, because we had to get back. And we just went over and over and over technique, and it'd be nice to be able to know that these things are available because, you know, quite honestly, if... You know, if if uh, you know, I I taught uh, a seminar uh, or I taught a part of a seminar for Tuan Jared in uh, Sukijor in uh, the Philippines in 2019, and it was amazing. It was really great. I I, I got to train with some friends, and I got you know I, I had a lot of friends who were part of the system, and I you know it was great. And I was able to give them an awful lot of information and you know it's like you just you want to be able to do that you it's like you know like it's not like i don't learn this stuff for 40 years to hold it in and never show anybody i really really want to show it but at the same time you know if people are always going yeah but what happens if you get attacked by a rhinoceros like um oh, i don't know i honestly don't know <laughs> you, know, it's, you always get stupid questions like that. You know, it's like yeah, they're not yeah. going to try. You know, it's like you know, it's like, you know imagine you know if Jared trying to teach a you know a knife counter and said, yeah, but what if the guy's got a machine gun? Like, like uh, uh, well, I don't know. I honestly don't know. That's the answer to that question. So you just want to be able to say, okay, it'd be like an, a, a finishing school you know, or a graduate school. I mean, people go to graduate you know, they've got their PhDs, and they say, what am I doing? How do I do it? And I go here and I go there and I can get all this information. And then, okay. you know, some kind of written written statement that said, yeah, this person passed this test or this person has this information. And now, you know, so they can bring it back and then they can, they can use it to improve themselves or improve where they are. All right. All right. Okay. So, okay, guys, the rapid fire, because I got like five more. So, all right. Pick me, pick me, pick me. What I would like to see, Jared oh, yeah. and I are doing in a couple of weeks in Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah. We're going to turn instructors yeah. together yeah. from different groups and teaching together. And Phil, you and I got to do one one day too. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I, the older I get, the more I like to have that kind of format. There's two instructors teaching the same seminar. And you kind of, you know, Phil and I are going to do three hours in the morning, and then a different instructor three hours in the afternoon. I've done one in Italy with a Salat instructor from England, where I did, we taught simultaneously our A's and A's, and then afternoon switch, and then we taught our B's and B's, you know. So uh, I would like to see more of that. Guru Dan, you know, was the the founder of that idea mm -hmm. in the United States, in my definitely, mind. Definitely. With him, Master Chai, and... Um, Francis Fong, we're constantly no, going yeah, around that together. Was, that was a dream team. We got a lot out of that. Everyone came back raving for the most kind of things. 
you know. And any time I've done, I remember I did '96. Uh, I did a seminar with Mark Denny, a charity seminar for uh, somebody who died in Oklahoma. I forget his name. It's been a while, but um, the guys loved it. When you can get two instructors of similar things together, mm -hmm. and the guys see both, you know, they both they they do both in the same day. The, the students get a lot out of that. Yeah, they and really it's love it too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, good for them. Yeah. it's good for everybody. Uh, Juwan, Jared, favorite weapon or weapons or training? Um, geez, you got to make me pick one. <laughs> it can be um, a combination thereof or single. What I guess what you know. I always love coming back to single stick. I mean, you know, okay. that's just for me. That's the, that, I mean, I love knife. I love knife stuff, but. Really, I just when I get that stick in the hand, it's and and I, I mean, and that's the really the roots of of the art is just that as this is the stick, and so I just like taking it back to the roots, and I really got to say I really like, like single stick. Yeah, it's knife knife for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, two on Phil, favorite weapon or weapons? Um, I I I guess it's uh, the same as Jared is single stick because uh, it's it's what I it's what I go back to. I mean, I I know mm -hmm. it's it's easily translatable to the sword but at the same time it's like you know the way i've been doing single stick lately has been more sword like it's you know the the the, the more along that path you get because you know the, of course everybody goes yeah well the stick is round I said yeah but it's true it's round but from the first time we pick up a stick in pikiti you're being told that this is a stick this is not just a stick your knuckles represent the the blade mm -hmm. it, when you do this you have to use a certain mechanics you can't just swing back and forth so you you there's a certain thing that you would want to do and you know and i quite honestly the more i start getting i mean i i do an awful lot of the dog brother stuff and so we you know i might be my feeling is is truly that you know you learn so much from getting hit because it makes you realize that oh I shouldn't be there or, Oh, I should do this differently. Or, mm. you know, I, or I, you know, if you start learning that, you know, you can actually defend against it because the biggest problem a lot of people, you know, do. And when they just, you know, they go into full contact stick fighting is they, they just sort of go, they just close their eyes sort of, and they swing like crazy. And, you know, I mean, uh, I remember the last time I fought, which was actually at that same camp in, uh, in Sukijor, it was kind of funny because it was like, you know, it was it was funny being the guy that everybody was like, oh, you know, because I mean, everybody would, you know, whenever Jared would show up, it was hilarious because they would all go, there was a, a, a real hush that would come over the crowd because they would, they would expect, you know, Jared to kill them. But it was funny because the two guys that I was against, one guy had never done it before, really. And another guy had a bit of experience, but he was very muscular. And it was not so much that I killed him or anything, but it was just sort of this whole idea of like, my God, you hit me. Uh, yeah, it's what I'm supposed to do, mm -hmm. and it was like it was just very funny because you know I mean Jared, Jared sort of like there was this kind of this accepted you know thing. Oh well, I'm going to get hit by Jared, but it was just funny because I I'm you know I'm not the youngest guy on the block anymore, and so as a result when you, when I when you do stuff you know when you chase somebody down you go they're all like I I didn't expect you to run after me well. I didn't expect you to run away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you run. which resulted in me running after you. <laughs> but I you know it's, a, it's purely simply that. But single stick. I did. Okay. I did yeah, right. I don't know. Um, Tuan Bill, favorite weapon. Favorite weapon to teach is advanced single stick and a spotted dagger. To guys who are ready to learn advanced spotted dagger. Favorite technique for me to practice. I'm I'm getting into the non picketty weapons, uh, the intermediate things like Bowie knife, kukri. I love. I'll get out in the deck and play with my kukri. And but I really what I want to learn is mid height staff. Like all over the world, you'll have this uh, staff. A lot of times carried by shepherds. That's about heart height. I want to. I want to learn more of that because a little bit of it. Okay. I want to learn it for myself. Okay. Um, what other two on Jared? If there was another FMA system that you could do or wanted to do, what would it be? What would it be? Gosh, um, the, I mean, there's a lot, and they're almost in my mind, almost um, you know, equal. Um, I really, I really enjoy um, uh, what I what I've what I see in FCS Kali. 
Um, and I've spent quite a bit of time teaching alongside Tuhon Ray Dionaldo and, uh, you know, his, um, I mean, and again, I can say the same about a lot of the Filipino. So if, if any other grandmasters out there watching, I, I'd love all of the Filipino. I mean, if I just had the time of, uh, in my sure, life, sure. I would train mm -hmm. all of them. But the one that, you know, uh, the one that stands out right now as I think about it is uh, I kind of like some of the things that I see in um, FCS in the, uh, the F S FCS Cali. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's one, one of one of the many that I would, uh, you know, would, would probably okay. spend a bit of time training. To one Phil, if you could choose another system that Kelly on the <laughs> And I, I say that because there's an awful lot of stuff that we did in the early days. Like, yeah. you know, the, the, the techniques, I'm starting to realize that, that not, you can find the, the root of them or a similar version of them in Kelly on the uh, in, in the original double stick stuff we did, there was something called, you know, switching thrust and, you know, Tom used to show it to us and, and it would be like switching thrust and, and you realize now it's actually more like um, up and down Xing. And so I went, oh, okay. So it's timing. And uh, you realize after a while that, you know, the fact that this guy, I'll say it nicely, he killed a lot of people because his stuff worked and he died in his bed. And for that reason alone, you know, it, it, an awful lot of his stuff you can't just sort of pass on it, you know. And ironically, I met a lot of guys who practiced it that I didn't know were practicing it, but came in later that they were practicing it. But you know, these these are the type of things that uh, I think are really important. And I, I, you know, if I had the if I had my druthers and you know, there was somebody you know good enough to train with, I would train with them. Yeah, the whole thing concept practice and the gap finding. Then yeah, it's 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 special. Yeah, definitely an argument here. The, but also, 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 one last thing. Sure. You know, you always hear about people saying, "Oh, well, you know, it's combat geometry." These guys use actual geometry. They they mm -hmm. learn how to step away from attack and no, attack just by about an inch. And no, it's Bogata, definitely, yeah. yeah, definitely on the five or seven, uh, absolutely. Um, Tuan Bill, uh, you okay? You mentioned oh the step right or okay. Um, Okay, what? Okay, two on Jared. Uh, one um, one thing. Uh, what could you say nice about the uh, the other two ons here? Uh, <laughs> what do you feel the other two ons have done well or created? Or... We haven't died yet. <laughs> <laughs> the two on Jared. Uh, what could you say about two on Phil? Um, Lots of great things, and, and there's a reason why um, why um, Tuhan, Tuhan Phil has been uh, has been a guest instructor at several of my uh, conferences. Well, I shouldn't say several, but some of my conferences, and will continue to be. Um, is it, uh, and 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 from my inter or uh, observation of uh, and and again, I'm going to have a lot more experience with this in Las Vegas in a, in a couple of weeks. But with with Tuhan Bill, the same thing. I really like the the, the structured and method methodical approach that they have to teaching. The, uh, there's a lot of thought there. A deep, you know, there's a lot of um, a deep thought process that have been put into their methodology, the way that they structure, the way that they teach, um, the, the depth of knowledge that they have in the art. You know, they've been in it. You know, each of them for what for 20 years longer than I have. Um, and so uh, there's there's a lot of depth of knowledge in the art that I uh, hold it very in very high high regard. And so um, those are. And again, I could say that a lot. You can say that about probably you know some other instructors out there, but their ability, the reason why they are here on the show and they are relevant is because mm. they have um, demonstrated an ability to, to 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 teach that knowledge to in a way that people just like it. People people learn from them and the structure as well. And um, there's a lot of things that they will be able to teach people in the art that that I I can't and uh, and I'd like that because I'd like to learn also and to to observe and to learn and to and to expand in my knowledge. So you know just their, their teaching ability and the, and their ability to raise that depth of knowledge that they have in the art. Um, and again, I'm kind of using a blanket statement because it's really applicable to, to both of them. No, no, that's fine. To both of them. Um, two on Phil, what, what say you about the other two? Uh, well, I mean, I can't really say much more to Bill than I've already said to him because I, you know, it's like, I, I keep right now. I'm sort of, I remember him being not a two on, so I never had to call him Tuhan. I kind of insisted on doing it because he was, mm -hmm. uh, and and he's a you know he's he's a you know he's an amazing guy that has 
basically, you know, he's he's kept, you know, what he's been given. He's kept he's kept true to that. You know, we always hear politically about, oh well, you know, this person, that person, this person, and you go, uh, you you have to learn to just, you know, shut out the noise because there's a lot of noise out there. You know, mm. and uh, so he's amazing. But uh, you know, to on Jared, I mean, regard, regardless of what has happened. You know, it, it, you may, it may have been only 15 years ago since you came into Bikini. I remember being at a... a, a well, 25 a, years now, but t- yeah, 15 since I was promoted. I remember being, at a, we being at a camp. We were at, uh, you know, and it was like, I, I was teaching a class at the same time. I had two people. He had like 150. And, you know, it's just like, he is, he is he, you know, he has that magnetic personality. And then you just, you, you know, and it, that combined with his skill set. You know, because you know, when he's when he sparred, you know, people weren't going, oh, I'm fighting with the two on. He, he, he. They were going, oh, God, <laughs> I, I I'm fighting Jared. Uh, do I if I can run now, can I possibly beat him to the door? Uh, can I win? You know, it's that type of thing. So there's a, you know, this, you know, he is he is the real deal. He he he, he comes equipped and ready to play. But, you know, play with all the bears out there. So he's, you know, he's, to, he's one of those guys. <laughs> that's why i know i look at his uh his university there and um you know like i mean i i'm thinking like i gotta do this i gotta do this and i look at everything i also got going on and then it's like a, uh, uh, you know and um but talking to paulo and uh so everything you said about tuan jared um yeah i mean it's um all of you. I mean, you know, I, you guys wouldn't be on here if I, I, honestly, if I didn't have high amount of respect for each and one of you. I mean, so that goes without saying. Um, but Juan, Bill, what do you have to say about your counterparts? Oh, uh, a little more specific, I think. Um, I was really extremely uh, impressed by Jared's um, two things. One of the, the, the methods he uses to teach law enforcement are right in the money. The way he took penetration technique and compressed just the things they need in the way they will receive them best. I, as a law enforcement instructor myself, uh, you know, I really, I really, that guy knows what he's doing. Um, and then the other side of that is the uh, stuff that he learned that uh, he learned in the 90s. Jared has is my favorite practitioner of the newer stuff. There were the, I, um, I think I mentioned the other day the cold mama drill, which we got pieces of things that look kind of like that, but they're in other places when I was learning and Phil was learning. But Phil's the only one who does it with good footwork. I mean, um, uh, Jared. I haven't seen Phil yet do it, but he might do it too, with good footwork too. Probably does, but. Uh, Jared is doing instinctively proper footwork, and if you're beginning to be a church of any amount of time, footwork is there for a reason. It's really important. It's, it puts you in the better place. It puts you on the high ground, Anakin. You know, it's it's, um, it's those two specific things. And then with Phil, Phil, you know, he impresses me. He's, he's older than me, and he's still sparring, you know? Uh, you know, that really impresses me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's not easy to do at our age. I mean, I, you know, you get arthritis, you get and asthma. You get injuries. Injuries. Yeah, yeah, things take a long time to heal. <laughs> I'm feeling, you know, after 40, I started to feel things that happened to me in my yeah. teens. No, they no. come back to haunt you. Oh, I'm, I healed up fine from that. No, no, wait, wait a couple of years. Mm-hmm. So Phil is still out there sparring. I'm very, very impressed by that. Yeah. Um, and and we kind of have dueling levels of humor, you know. So, you know, Phil, Phil and I, you know, we, we see we can tell the worst joke. And we're kind of duking it out. I think we're kind of even. I, I'm not. Too, I'm right behind you there, or maybe in front of you. <laughs> yeah. there. I'm not sure. Yeah. But, uh, all right, we we went um, we went over, but it was well worth it. And I'm so glad. Twan Phil, you were able to finally get on. That's uh, oh, gosh, better yes. Late than never. <laughs> yeah, better late than never, though. I'm so glad we were, uh, obviously, with the help of uh, Tuan, Jack, and Paul, they were determined to get you on. So I'm so happy uh, you were able to do that and they were able to help out. But this has absolutely been absolutely wonderful. And um, I appreciate appreciate you guys coming on. And I, I know we went past two hours, uh, but uh, uh, hopefully I didn't 
anger spouses or significant others or, or what have you. <laughs> My wife if I did, you could just blame me. <laughs> so yeah, well, thanks I'll for the advice. And say it's Frank, it's Dean's fault. Oh, okay, that's, that's it. <laughs> you know, that guy in FMA discussion Thank made you, me stay here. He kept asking me questions. <laughs> so, um, I, I really I, I, it's, it's a privilege for me to be on here with uh, within the uh, and you know as I said when I was with Tu and uh, Bill in the, in the recent um, uh, podcast. I, I'm in the in the uh, the company of giants here, and uh, and I really um, am uh, humbled. To be, you know, side by side with this gentleman in, in, yeah. in this type of a format. So, thank you. No, again, absolute pleasure. Uh, so, uh, I really appreciate it. You guys doing this? I thought you guys were you stayed pretty much non-political. You were elegant in your uh, answers and all that, giving each other credit and praise. I think that's what this community is about. And um, I wish you guys the best in your thing in Las Vegas. I hope it turns out wonderful. To on Phil, you're gonna have to do something with these two. You got, you got to make up for it. We're gonna to have to uh, do a joint thing with these guys. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't smoke. Do a uh, three amigos seminar, Phil. <laughs> we have to make it happen, Tuan Phil. We gotta get you out of Canada. Uh, well, we still have this COVID thing going on, yeah. and it makes difficult. It makes it difficult to cross, get across any I borders. <laughs> I mm. I'm hoping. I'm hoping, and I'm praying, and I'm expecting next year to be better, guys. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. God, if it's that, not, that's man. pretty pessimistic. You're hoping next year to be better. <laughs> mm, uh, I'm hoping that by the end of this year, it's it's a lot. Well, better. maybe it's realistic, but we'll see. <laughs> you know, realistic, optimistic, or pessimistic, but we'll see. Uh, okay. I hope so too, guy. I mean, I can't even imagine doing a whole another calendar year of this, and you know, mass, no mass, passport, you know, the ID. <laughs> Verification. <laughs> Don't get me started on politics, Dean. No, I, I know. I'm with you there. I'm as local well. as you, but to me, um, yeah, I know. Zero, I know. To zero tolerance. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but at any rate, um, I appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. You guys take care. And um, of course, when I get this downloaded and all that, I will, if I can't put it on your wall, I'll definitely put the link in Messenger. Okay. 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 All right. Well, you all take care. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all, guys. All right. Thank you, Dean. Have a good evening, guys. Talk soon. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right. All right. Oof. Uh, one longer than I expected. But uh, when you get three guys like that, it's kind of hard not to. So, yeah. So, look for the download version and all that. And who's next? Oh, tomorrow night. Uh, uh, this month's been a tough month as far as makeups are concerned. Um, we have some issues. So Joe Apostle, Canada, yeah, tomorrow night, 5.30, not the usual time, 7, but 5.30. Um, looking forward to that. Joe seems like he's a good guy. Friend Apollo's, so he has to be all right. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, that's uh, Joe Apostle, tomorrow night, episode uh, 203. All right, folks, if you haven't already, please subscribe to FMA Discussion on YouTube. We give all monetary proceeds to charity. You are actually helping us help people. You, in turn, will be helping people. All our money goes to charity. We just started receiving in. There's a you know, gap of time, three months before things um, you know, they come in. You have to re meet a threshold and what have you. And we finally met that. So we already gave to one charity. Um, uh, name is escaping me now, but it was a guy, uh, England was putting it together and, um, and all that for uh, a house that burned down. And uh, Gosh, San Miguel, Screamer, and oh, uh, Jim Mendoza. That was it. That was it. So uh, please, uh, we help people. None of us are taking any of the money from this. We are giving it to charities. And it just so happened there was a terrible incident in the Philippines with this uh, poor man's house burning down, and we were able to help with that as, much, as well as others. So keep that in mind. When you subscribe, you are helping people. All right, folks, thank you, and I'll see you uh, tomorrow night.